Welcome everyone. This is Michael Gibbs and I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Architects and Go Cloud Careers. And this is day two of our free CCNA program. Now this is the CCNA 200-301 course. And my name is Michael Gibbs and this is day two. This is network administrator training, network engineer training, whether you call it networking for cloud computing or cloud computing technical skills. What we're here about today is to talk about networking. So well, the networking is a critical cloud architect skill. It's critical in cloud architect training. And if you want a career, the best cloud career tips I can give you is to learn the network in the data center. So we're here with a complete and total set of cloud network training and a completely free Cisco CCNA course to help you build your best networking or cloud computing careers. So I like to view the CCNA as an intro to networking course, where we'll talk about everything from what is a computer network to CCNA course for beginners. But let's just face it, we're going to teach you networking. We're going to have lots of labs. We're going to have lots of discussion. We'll have plenty of time for questions and answers because I want all of you, whether you want to be a cloud architect, a solution architect, a network administrator, a network engineer, or a network architect to get the right training. A little bit about me, in case you don't know, I've been working in networking forever. My Cisco certified internet expert number is 7417. I spent about a decade at Cisco as a lead architect in an industry vertical. I've worked for the world's largest internet service provider, which was WorldCom at the time, which is now Verizon. I had the opportunity to be a lead network architect on Wall Street and design the busiest market maker systems on the NASDAQ. I got to be a principal two architect at Comcast responsible for the backbone design. I got to be an industry specific architect at uh, Cisco and I got to be a lead architect doing consulting for IP multicast and video solutions over at Riverstone. So I've been doing this networking thing forever and I've been teaching networking at Riverstone Networks, WorldCom when I was there or even Cisco systems. So. This is me and I've been doing it for a while. So we're going to have networking fun. So before we begin, let me tell you one thing that I want you all to attend. Please join me tomorrow for our completely free How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar. Please join us. The link is in the description below. We will tell you everything you need to do if you desire to be a cloud architect. And guess what? A lot of this stuff is going to be useful if you want to be a network engineer, network administrator, network architect as well because... We'll tell you the things that the hiring managers care about. We'll show you the things that should be on your resume when you have no experience. And we'll teach you all how to get cl cloud hired. So everybody, to let me know that we're ready to begin, type hashtag CCNA and also hashtag cloud hired at the same time. Hashtag CCNA, hashtag cloud hired. When I see a bunch of those, I know we're all ready to begin for the day. You guys are awake, alert, and oriented and excited to begin. So give me a hashtag CCNA. And then after that, a hashtag cloud hired is two separate messages. When I see a bunch of those go across the stream and it's going to be looking like a shower of cloud hired and a shower of hashtag CCNAs, I know we're going to be out there. Now, tomorrow's free webinar, while you're giving me these hashtags, is going to be exclusively on Zoom, not YouTube. And here's the reason. I want every one of you to be able to ask questions live. Come to this session. We're going to have an absolute ball. I'll tell you how to get hired, and you can ask me questions. We can go over your background, your goals, all of it, all of it, all of it. So love to get you all cloud hired, network hired, or whatever it is you want. Network administrator, network architect, network engineer, solution architect, cloud architect. The whole point is to get hired. So tomorrow's webinar is extremely exclusive. It's going to be limited to the people that sign up on Zoom. So sign up now and let's make sure we have a great day tomorrow. Let's get you all CCNA certified in our CCNA 200-301 class. And this is free CCNA 200-301 training part two. So let's get into the fun. Let's start talking about our, our CCNA course. Today we're going to talk a little bit about LAN switching. We'll talk about LAN switching com, co concept. And we'll actually walk through playing with some switches. Now, we'll have a ball with this. So let's talk about, you know, what is switching and campus lands. So realistically speaking, this is pretty normal. You might have a data center. And then across the building, you may have uh, a bunch of users for that. 
So you can kind of think about that. In this particular environment, you've got a data center, and then you've got the campus, and the campus is a bunch of people plugged into switches, which ultimately go to routers, and they have high-speed connections back to the data center. That's traditional environment. Oh, wait, cloud computing. Guess what? See where we have the campus LAN? We have two connections to the cloud provider, and instead of the, being the data center LAN, it's just the cloud provider. So data center here, cloud there. Nothing changes. So if this was on the cloud, guess what? We'd have the same virtual machines, that we'd be using the switches at Amazon or Google or Microsoft or it doesn't matter. And it's the same thing. What is a cloud? Randy else's network in a data center. So what is a cloud? It's a rented data center that's a virtual private data center. That's it. So this is your typical campus, but this is also your typical cloud environment too. It's the same thing. So when we talk about switching, we kind of have to look at what we're switching. So Remember that we're going to talk about Ethernet because when we're switching, we're predominantly dealing with Ethernet. So what does an Ethernet frame look like? Well, remember, we've got the preamble. We've got the destination MAC address. <coughs> Where is it going? Source MAC address, the type, the data. Now, that's your payload. So it could be a voice packet. It could be a video packet. It could be anything. That's your payload, but it's a frame at this level. And then there's this thing called the frame check sequence. If basically, if that gets corrupted, you know that your data is corrupted or your frame is corrupted. That's all. We don't need to make it complicated. And I know in networking and cloud, we make simple things very complicated, but we don't have to. Well, that's really all that's going on. So, so let's walk through it. Typical switch forwarding. So let's say we've got uh, Eva Doikia over here. Well, I like to call it Evo, even though it's not her real name. I just like to call her that, and she's super awesome. We've got Laman, who's a fantastic network engineer over here. We've got me over here, and we've got Chris over here. So what's going to happen if we're in the switch, what's going to happen if Laman wants to speak to Eva Dykia, he's going <coughs> to send the frame. And what's going to happen is the switch initially is going to say, I don't know where to send it, so it's going to flood it out this port. It's going to flood it out this port. And then it's going to flood it out this port. And then what's going to happen is Eva Doikia, where it says Evo is going to say, I have this MAC address. Let's talk. And then when Eva Doikia responds, it goes into the switch. And the switch says, do I know where to send it? Which port? And it looks in its MAC address table and it says, I sure do. Laman sent a request to Eva Doikia on fast Ethernet port 01. So what happens is this port gets flooded out all ports. Then Eva Doike responds, and Eva Doike responds, and then the switch looks in its MAC address table, and it says, yes, I know the DMAC, the destination MAC address go out this port. And now, as long as Eva Doike and Laman are communicating, everything's working perfect. Now, Eva Doike says, I want to send a picture of Mike's cat. So I want a picture of Mike's cat. So Eva Doike requests something from me. She wants a photo of my cat, Cindy. She loves cats. So the request goes out this port and this port and this port too. And then I respond, I'm here, Eva Doikia, I'm here. And I respond to her. And now the switch looks at it and says, does it know Eva Doikia's port? If not, it floods. And it says, it sure does because we sent it and now you see. So what we see over here, this MAC address, that's like the routing table at layer three, but at layer two switches forward on MAC address. At layer three, switch routers forward on IP address. Same thing, no difference. So that's really what's going on. At layer two, at Ethernet switching, we're dealing with MAC address labels. So now let's pretend we have two switches. Same thing. Laman wants to send out something to Eva Doikia, but he's never sent her a packet before. So what's going to happen? Well, at first, it's going to be flooded out this port this port, which is then going to get flooded out this port and this port too, on a separate switch. And then it's also going to flood it out this port. And then Eva Doike responds and says, I have this MAC address. And guess what? The switch builds a, an entry in the MAC address table. The typical, you, if you ever heard the term CAM table, which means content addressable memory, same thing as the MAC address table that they're talking about. And realistically speaking, that's how all this stuff works. So pretty simple stuff. Switches forward based on destination MAC address. If they don't know where to go, they flood it everywhere. Then somebody says, I got it. 
and then it only sends it out that port and the rest of the ports don't get used. So switching really constrains your traffic. The only time you have broadcast is either it's a broadcast that gets sent out all ports, or if it's a unicast frame, meaning one to one person, and it comes out until you learn, you send it out ports, and as soon as you learn, you only send it out the right port. And that's what we're talking about with switching. That's the way the learning works. That's how switches determine how to send data from point A to point B. <clears throat> and if you want to look at it a little deeper, what you can see is when these packets are flooded, you can see what's responding. There's an address table before and afterwards, and it's populating. And, and that's really what's going on. It's really no different than things. So because of that, because the way bridges and switches work, where are they taking your traffic? And they flooded out every port, except the one it came in on to learn. So switches flood traffic out every port, except the one it came in on. So know that that concept is critical for what we're going to get into next. Switches take all unknown MAC addresses, and they broadcast it out all ports until someone says, I got it, and then it only sends it out this port and not the rest. So. That's how switches learn. So I want you to think about something. And I want you to really understand the complexities of how challenging this could get. So now, let's pretend we've got frames and we don't know where to send them. So let's look at this ex example. And I'm actually going to draw this with you while we talk. I want to talk about it. And yes, I've got professionally drawn slides for this. But let's just have a little fun and whiteboard this out. So imagine this. You got to switch one. SW. Call it one. And now let's have a little fun with this. Let's add switch two. Switch two. While we're at it, let's copy these things. Let's make switch three. And switch four. Now this is where things get ugly. So of course, we never want an environment without redundancy. So if currently speaking, we have something that looks like this right now, as it stands right now, switch three can talk to switch one, who can talk to switch two, switch four. So everyone right now can talk to each other. Now we've got no fault tolerance in our network and this would be a horribly stupid thing to design our systems this way because there's no fault tolerance. This is about the equivalent of using a single cloud provider, um, something you should never ever do and that's why you should always go multi-cloud. But let's just say over here, you've got Evo. So you got Evo Doikia sitting on over here, um, EV, uh, EVO. So Evo is over here. Now Evo likes my cat, Cindy, and she wants to send a message to Cindy. And Cindy's really sweet. Um, so what happens is currently speaking, this is the way this is gonna work. Eva Dyke, and let's let's make sure we have a couple extra ports on the switch. Um, this is what this is going to be an Ethernet LAN, and this, by the way, is a symbol for a LAN. And there's a reason we're working through this. And by the way, let's put an extra switch port over here, and let's pop an extra switch port over here. So now I want you to really think about this. Evo wants to reach Cindy. So yesterday we talked about our. So she says, "What Cindy's IP address?" And she does an ARP, who has the MAC address for Cindy. Now, as soon as she does that, this packet is flooded. It, the switch doesn't know where Cindy's MAC address is. So this, the, it hits switch four. Switch four sends it out this port and this port into switch two. Switch two sends it into switch one out this port. Oops, I don't know, even know what happened there. And then switch one moved it over to switch three. And switch three sends it to Cindy the cat. Cindy the cat purrs, meows, takes a selfie with my cell phone because she steals things. My Cindy's a thief. She steals everything. Now, Cindy responds. And now the next time Evo wants to talk to Cindy, it follows the path because she already knows. Now, Cindy and Evo are talking to each other, and they're all having a really good time. And then we decide that uh, Evo likes cats so much she wants to see cat, Chris's cat, Cindy, or Sunny. So now we've got Sunny over here, Sunny the cat, and I'm going to show you what's going to happen when these guys try and talk. 
So right now, everything's fine. But a Sonny the Cat read Mike's manual that says, never have any single points of failure. So Sonny the Cat decides to put a cable between switch three and switch four. And Sonny the Cat says, Mike, I heard you say one is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. So I added an extra cable. Now, I want you to think about a problem. So Evo sends a message request. ARP, who has the MAC address for Sunny? What happens? I want you to think about this because this is where it gets ugly. And this is why we're going to talk about another program call. So Evo sends the message to switch four. Switch four sends it out this port and this port. Switch two sends it to switch one and it sends it out here. Now switch one, it sends it over to switch two. It sends it out this port. It sends it out this port, but it also sends it out this port. And now we've got traffic that's going to be circulating forever, 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 all this unknown traffic. Eva Doikia sends a ARP or a broadcast message. It circulates, it circulates, it circulates, it circulates. The network recreates it. It's one message. It becomes two messages. It becomes four messages. And the next thing you realize, the network is dead. It's called a broadcast storm. And why does that occur? Because switches forward unknown broadcasts out of all ports except the one they came in on. So, Sunny the Cat, when she read my manual on high availability, when she said, I'm going to run an extra cable, and she did, she broke something. Now, why? Because the way switches behave. So what if you could run this cable between these two switches and tell the cable, don't be active. And then if this thing fails and this link goes off, Tell this link, be active, be active immediately. So now Evo sends the message. It goes out switch two. There's no place to go. It goes out this port. It goes out this part. And now it hits Sunny the Cat. And Sunny the Cat comes in and brings it back. And it goes back to Evo. And we don't have this problem. So when we're dealing with switching, which is not routing, switching cannot have all links active at the same time or you get the looping of your traffic. It's called a broadcast storm. So we need something that will tell these links to dynamically block, unblock, block, unblock, block, unblock. And that's how we make our systems reliable. So that's called a broadcast storm. So if you're there and you're paying attention and you got it, type hashtag CCNA. Because now we're going to get into the spanning tree, which is a little ugly. So I want to make sure that we're all ready. So give me a hashtag CCNA, and then we'll go start talking about spanning tree. We'll be talking about that today. So what do we do? How do we stop this? We create that dynamic protocol. That dynamic protocol is spanning tree. And I'll show you why. We'll look at MAC address tables, the switches. We're going to have some fun. And when we do this, it's going to make a total bit of sense. So start walking our way through. Alexandros, I'm happy to see you. Tom Orthios, Doidio. Um, for the rest of you, CCNA, I think it's so fantastic. Um, um, fantastic. So let's have some fun with this. So now... If we look in this environment, we clearly can see that this stuff looping around forever is a problem. So we're going to have a protocol called spanning tree, which we're going to get into at some point to talk about that. But I want to make sure you understand it. So these switches build a table, and it looks like a routing table. But it's not. It's a switching table. So what's it going to look like? If we go, and we'll do this. At some point, we'll do a show MAC address table on one of our switches. And here's what you're going to see you're going to see the MAC address, the VLAN, and the port numbers are associated with And when you do that, you're going to totally understand it. It'll make total sense for you. So now, um, let's go back to the single switch, remind everybody what it looks like. Everybody's sending information to each other. Single switch topology, we don't have any of these problems. So let's... Uh, Let's, let's get on board. Let's get on the switch for a little while. Let's have some fun with it. Let's boot up a switch. Let's walk through the console. So let me go to my fancy EVENG server. 
um, right now. Um, pretty sophisticated setup we actually have running here. Um, this is a full enterprise grade version of this. Um, let's do this. Let's make a new lab. Closed lab. Okay, so if any of you guys ever decide to uh, invest in an EV and J server, and again, you know, this can get fairly expensive because for what we're using here, we're using a 24 core server with a half a terabyte of RAM. Uh, you know, we're making sure we've got all the good stuff on it. Um, but, you know, that's for us. So let's just basically, we're going to create a new lab and walk through our place with a switch. We'll call it basic switch. And in the switch, we'll just say uh, demo. Um, and if you ha happen to get an EVENG server, there's a community one, which is great. This is obviously the production kind that organizations use to test things. Demo switch. So let's make sure we do this. Now we're going to save this. Um, whatever, whatever, whatever. Do it require, do I need to add anything else? Name, description, demo, save. Why is it not taking it? I must be missing something. Oh, basic switches. There we go. All right, I guess it would help if uh, I would read the instructions, which would tell me that I named the same thing twice. So let's, uh, in our object over here, well, in our node, let's pick a Cisco IOS on Linux Squish. Um, let's add some Ethernet ports. Let's change it to 24 so it feels like a switch. Let's save it. Now let's take this switch up. Let's switch. Let's boot it up. Let's console into it. And hopefully you guys are having an easier time seeing this. Um, what we decided to do is we found some settings on the browser, which should be able to make uh, it a little easier for you to see. They do take a minute to boot. So we'll work our way through it. All right, come up, wake up. Okay, as we can see, the router is coming up. It's coming up. Slowly coming up. That is the thing with technology. Especially when you're doing live demos, it's never as fast as you want it to be. And, you know, at some point, I promise you, you're going to be doing lots and lots of demos of stuff, especially presentation demos of things. And when you're in these kind of environments, let me tell you, um, uh, you find yourself to be pretty busy. So, and reality is, is demos never work the way you want them to be. Um, but that's just part of life. So, is our switch fully up yet? Okay, we're here. It's a switch. So, everybody, let's walk our way through the switch a little bit. Let's have a little fun with the switch. So, let's look at some uh, things we can do on the switch. So, we can look at the interfaces, right? So, we can see what's kind of in there. So, let's look at the interfaces. So, let's do uh, the show interface status. Show interface status. What do we see? We can see there's a whole bunch of ports in here. What do we see? We see the G0 slash zero ports, the G1 slash ports, the G2. And when you see these numbers slash something, they're referring to the, the card number and the port number per card. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. That's what that means. So now you know what it looks like. You can look at a switch and there's there. So we can also see what VLANs exist. We'll talk about virtual LAN. So what you're going to see here is VLAN 1, which is the natural VLAN on all switches, which is a virtual switch. We'll talk much more about VLANs. Now, you're also going to see a couple of other VLANs. I'm telling you this. FIDI um, was something that we used to use back in 1999, 1998, 1997. Um, so these kinds of interfaces, for the most part, are some pretty old networking things that we're not going to be using. But keep that in the back of your mind. VLAN 1, and we can create um, as many VLANs as we want on these devices um, by using some VLAN things, and we'll be walking through configuration commands as appropriate. So let's pretend we wanted to see what was going on on one of these interfaces. Um, we'd be able to do a show, interfaces, 
um, let's say we pick an interface G0 slash zero, and we could look at counters. And what this will do is it'll tell us, you know, how much stuff was passing through the traffic. Guess why? How much stuff is passing through there? None. Do you know why? It's dead. And that's why, and I'll show you why, we're not going to get anything to our show interface counters. But I still want you to understand what it is just so you know what it is. Let's walk through uh, some other stuff. If we wanted to see the MAC address table, and we're going to build a lab later where you can, what we would do is we would show. You know how I showed you before we would do a show IP route for the routers? That's going to give you a layer three routes, which well, how many routes are we going to have here? None, um, because we didn't add any. But if we did a show MAC address table dynamic, we could actually see all the MAC addresses that were learned out all of these switchboards, which again is none. Why? Because it's a brand new switch. <coughs> and that's kind of the reason why. So let's go past this. So heck, while we're at it, um, let's 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 continue with on um, with this with the lab that we're doing over here. Um, for example, uh, I should walk you through how you do the show, show. So let's talk about basic switch stuff now. Let's do some basic switch configurations. So let's have a little fun with it. Let's talk about how do you secure the CLI. So, and then we'll talk about enabling an IP address for remote access. And then we'll talk about some miscellaneous settings. So switches and routers, you can, you can access them via a few ways. The virtual terminals like Telnet or SSH, the console where you plug it directly in. So in any case, you have the two things on the switch, just like you did for the router. So let's go back to that router like we did yesterday. When you log into the device and you first press enter, this is called user mode. And if you want to do anything here that's substantial, like config, no, it's not going to let you. So if you've ever been on a Unix machine, you try to execute something and you don't have execute permissions on the script, it won't let you. So this is no different. So <clears throat> if we want to configure or do anything or do anything complicated, we have to get to enable mode, also called privileged executive mode, otherwise known as root. All right, when you become root in Unix, you can do pretty much anything you want. So kind of keep this in the back of your mind. So now we're talking about root. So let's talk about some other things that we, we can do when we first get this. What should we do first? Guess what? We should probably put a password on the switch. So let's configure it. Configure this router. How do we configure switches and routers? We type config terminal, config T, T E R M I N A L, config terminal. Wow, we're in configuration mode. How do you know? It says config. So let's change the name on the switch. So let's call it host name um, Evo. I picked Evo. Um, obviously, you have to spell the word host name correctly. Now, I guess what's the switch called? It's called Evo. Pretty cool, right? Now, let's put a password on this switch so that you can't just type enable without a password. What do we think we're going to do there? We're going to type password. Now, because um, many of you at some point will do CCI labs and they'll force you <coughs> to use, God bless you, the password Cisco. We'll just call the password Cisco. By the way, for the longest time, that was the long, that was the most common um, um, password on the internet. Bear with me. Now, what happens? We want to, we'll get out of this. We want to go to log, log in. We're there. Enable. Wait, it needs a password. You have to type correctly, and now it lets me in. So that's the first thing that we're going to do with all these devices. We're going to configure it. Thank you so much, Aguilo. We're going to configure it. So next, let's configure our virtual lines. So config, so we can do this. We can, we can go to our configuration and we can type um, config A. 
We could do line v virtual terminal. Zero, we can pick four. Zero, we can 15. We can type login, type password. So what you can see here is we went to the virtual terminals. We set up a password. We determined whether we would allow SSH or Telnet in. I just decided to do both. And that's realistically speaking what we're talking about when we're setting these things up. It's pretty easy. Um, and you know, there's lots of ways we can do this. So now let's look at this. So when we run through our running configuration or what's actually going on on the routers, um, let's make sure we're here run you're going to see something that's probably not the good the best idea show run so as you're looking at the running configuration of this if you have the password to log in guess what you can see you can see the password now what if for example i'm doing my network architecture my network design and i'm having a ball with it we're super excited and i bring in my buddy billy bob to help me out now, Billy Bob is, uh, what do you call it? Billy Bob is an expert on BGP. So I bought Billy Bob in to look at my BGP. Does Billy Bob need to know my passwords? No. So we should never allow that. So how do we fix this? We configure this. We type enable secret. When we do this, um, and it's not going to like that. So let's see if it enables us to do it again, and it won't. So let's get let's give it Cisco one instead. Now let's do the let's look at the running config. Show run. What do we see? We see we. We can see the new enable secret password is this. Now, what else can we do? We can also do this. We config T. We can do service passwords encryption. Show run. Making sure our passwords look like this as opposed to like this. So we can get rid of that. Um, going to make life easy. No enable. Secret. And that's how quickly we remove it. And it's done. So just kind of keep this in the back of your mind. Um, that's kind of the things we're talking about. Let's walk through some little more things on the switch. Okay, so there you go. Um, I've enabled Telnet and SSH. Reality is in today's world, we should only implement SSH because it's much more secure. But, you know, just kind of keep that in the back of your thing. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is switched virtual interfaces. Let me see how much more content we have on that to determine whether we should take a break or not. So let's talk a little bit about switched virtual interfaces, and then I'll take a break and we'll go over some questions. So let's go to this environment here. So in a lot of environments, you're going to have what's called a switch inside of a switch. And what I mean by this is, got this switch. Great Cisco switch over here. And it's got a bunch of ports. At some point, I can chop these ports up into multiple switches. So what if I decided to say these ports over here were a single switch, and these ports over here were another set of single switches, and another set of ports here was a switch, and another set of ports here was a switch. That would be called a virtual LAN. And what is a virtual LAN? When you take one switch and you chop it up to multiple logical switches. Hmm. In cloud computing, what is a virtual machine? You take a server, you smack a hypervisor on it, and you use that hypervisor to chop it onto multiple things. So how old do you think virtualization is? Old. 
All the things that cloud computing is doing is old. It's 40 years old. This is virtualization 30 years ago. Pre-VMware even. What is it? You take a switch, you chop it up into a lot of switches. Now, what happens, and we're going to talk about this, is when we put our ports together, if we, if we cross subnets, we need a router. And by doing so, we need to route between subnets. So what will ultimately happen, we're dealing with switches as the concept. We can create a VLAN, but we can also create what's called a VLAN interface. And what is this? This is something very special and it's something very different. So if we go back to our server, if I do, a sh if I do, if I create an interface, I can create an interface called the VLAN. And uh, let's call it interface VLAN one. Now with this VLAN, what can I do? I can do the following. I can give it an IP address. 192.168.1.1.255.255.255.0.24. I can give it a no shut on this command. Now, guess what? I've got an IP address to the VLAN. Now, if I created two VLANs, let's do it. Interface VLAN 2. And in this VLAN, I do an IP address on a different subnet. 192.168.2.1.255.255.255.0. No shot. Now, let's look at this. If I do a show IP, IP interfaces, Let's, let's do a brief so we don't. Now, what do you see? Oh, wait. You got this VLAN 1 and VLAN 2. Now, you got two interfaces. Now, if we were to enable routing on this device, it would route between these interfaces. So how's this VLAN thing going to work? We're going to add ports. We're going to take you know these ports over here and say, hey, you're VLAN 1. And then we're going to take these ports over here, for example, and say you're VLAN 2. Or all of these are VLAN 2. And by determining which ports go to which virtual switch, guess what we have? Virtual switches! And what are the interfaces? It's a router inside of the switch. So a layer 3 switch is you take your ports, you add your ports to the VLAN, and then you convert this VLAN, and then you add IP addresses and you route between VLANs. So it's pretty cool stuff. So let's look at this. Um, look at this slide to see. So now we've got these ports in this VLAN. And we've got this port in this VLAN. Now we're routing in between subnets identically to the way we would do anything. Now let's just talk about this, the default gateway. So if your switch is not a router and you want to manage it via SSH or Telnet, it's going to need a route to be reached. Now, what could you use for the route? A default gateway, a default route. So your switches, if they're not layer three switches and they're not doing routing, will definitely need a default gateway to be managed. Just like any other computer that you have in your environment. If you wanted to configure an interface, we showed you how to do it. It's that easy. Guess what? If we wanted to put a the default gateway on it, we could do the same thing. We'd go back to our device. Config B. Sure I've got the, I don't really do a lot of work on switching. I predominantly work on routers in my life um, because I'm more of a routing and I was more of a routing engineer and then a routing architect. But the point is we IP and I think it's default dash gateway. And you would just give it an IP address. 1.2.3.4, just like you would your PC, other than you would hard code and manually assign it as opposed to doing this, um, what do you call it? Uh, I'm sorry, I was gonna show you how you do that. So if you wanted this to work, you would do an IP, I'm gonna put a default gateway on this, IP, default, gateway, and then you give it an IP address, 1.2.3.4, and we don't wanna install that because we don't have a router for it to point to, 1, 2, 3, 4, but Kind of just keep that in the back of your mind. That's what we're talking about. 
So while we're at it, um, you could also configure the to switch to use DHCP, which would be insane. Um, with networking devices, we don't do it, but we could do it. We could do config T. Oops. Um, let's create an interface VLAN three. And in this, we could do an IP address DHCP. Hey, Mike, are you sharing your screen? Oh, nope, I am not. So let's get out of this um, so I can I can demo it again. You can do this with this. Well, that didn't work. Give it a minute. It's trying to resolve the DNS name clear. I uh, should have disabled that functionality for the demo. Bear with us for a couple of seconds. But the good news was it'll clear the screen from some of the excess that I had here. Now, if you're working in a cloud environment and you have a direct connection or a private line or direct interconnect or express connect, as Azure likes to come up with their creative names, guess what? You typically send them a VLAN, so now you know why. Um, so let's say we create interface VLAN 3. 3. We can generally speaking, um, ugh, we got to be in configuration mode. Interface VLAN three. Now, when we can do this, we can put an IP address. They used to let you do via DHCP, um, but they don't allow you to do this right now. Um, but they used to let you set on one DB DHCP. And remember, I said never let anything automatically. Well, I guess that's why they disabled it. So you would just pop an address like one seventy two dot one six. Dot one dot zero, and then you'd enter a subnet mask, and you're good to go. And then you do a no shot on the interface, and Bob's your uncle. You are 100% up and running. Life is good. So, see if there's anything I wanted to show you. Now, there is one, one skill that I should try and show you. Um, generally speaking, these routers try to resolve DNS. In, in, until you until you said that. And what they will do is they will literally try and tell net into whatever you put the IP address for. So if you don't want that to happen, what you do is you, you set uh, no IP, I think it's domain dash, look, dash lookup. Now when you enter something silly like Cisco, nothing will happen. And then it won't be trying to resolve it for you and you're good to go. So let's do this. We covered a whole lot of tech, like a whole heck of a lot of tech. So. Chris from my team is going to bring some questions in. We'll bring some questions in. We'll answer some questions. And of course, this is networking. So networking is fun. So let's answer some questions. Let's make sure everything is clear. Chris, I know you've been seeing questions. I've been babbling about networking. I love networking. So let's make sure this is the best Cisco certified network associate boot camp you take. Let's make sure it's the best Cisco CCNA 300-2, I'm sorry, 200-301. CCNA 200-301, and this is a free CCNA bootcamp. So bring in your questions. We want to help you um, learn the network, learn the cloud, and get cloud hired, network hired, and everywhere in between. So Chris, bring in some questions. Mike, are you looking at the stream? Yes. StreamYard. It, it's, yeah, it's on the screen. I don't see anything in the stream here. Oh, wait, hold on. I could have two us. Uh... Oh, sorry about that. I had a, apparently I had two separate stream here windows open and didn't even realize. Sadie, we don't use Telnet anymore. We use SSH. Um, I just mentioned Telnet or SSH because there are some companies that are still using Telnet, but the reality is, is nobody should be using Telnet. It should all be used as SSH. Good question. I would recommend not using it, but people still do it. So there's that. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? Okay, so Angela, this is a good question. So the reality is, is this. You will never be able to put more than 250 hosts, max 500 in a single subnet. Here's why. 
ARPU has the MAC address of this. ARPU has the MAC address of this. Who has this? Who has this? So there's so much broadcast. So you're never going to be able to put more than, say, 250 to max 500 users in a single subnet. So we have to segment the network. Otherwise, the network falls apart. So that's why we're doing it. Now, let's think about it this way, Angelo. Let's talk about some other reasons. Let's say you work in the security department. They can put you on a subnet and then create a security policy that only you in the security department can even be able to reach um, the, uh, what do you call it? To even be able to reach the management ports of the switch. So you can literally put your users in a, v, in a VLAN and, and make it that they can't see anything outside of that VLAN or which they do. So we're creating VLANs for our network scalability, but also security. A finance VLAN, a development VLAN, a production VLAN, an interfacing VLAN, all separate from each other. So our demilitarized zone where our basically our firewalls and our load balancers sit and our VPN concentrators sit, that's going to be one VLAN with a set of security policies. Now, we're going to have different VLANs for different departments. The CEO may need to say everything. Um, somebody else may only need to access to one set of things. So we segregate our users. So by doing it, it's like having a house with a lot of bedrooms. You go to this bedroom, you go to this bedroom, you go to this bedroom. But the other reason is if we buy a high availability switch. Now, when we deal with the cloud providers, they're like, oh, we use any old router to connect to us. It doesn't matter. We're reliable. Now, what happens is when we're connecting to a cloud provider, if that router dies, we lose everything. So... <clears throat> We can't be afforded to do this. So we're going to be using big routers to connect to the cloud. Routers with two brains in it, two control modules in case one fails. Routers with multiple power supplies plugged into different outlets. So if there's a power failure or a circuit breakage, the network doesn't go down. We'll be putting our stuff on multiple line cards. And by the time we're done with this, these switches get really expensive. So by being able to virtualize them and create multiple VLANs, it, we can reduce the cost. So it's like any other kind of virtualization. Is it cheaper to go to AMD and buy one of these awesome 128 core servers with these Epic CPUs and about six terabytes of DRAM and run VMware? Yes, huge. Where it would not be efficient to just buy a bunch of four ser core servers and buying like, you know, 30 of them. And why? It's 30 sets of space, 30 sets of cooling, 30 sets of power. And that's the reason. So great question there. Chris, if you want to bring in the next one. Well, Elvis, at layer three, we have a destination IP address. So when layer three gets mapped to layer two, I have the destination IP address of 1.2.3.4. So what do I do? ARP, who has the MAC address of 1.2.3.4? And it literally says when you sniff it on a protocol analyzer, it'll say, ARP, who has the MAC address? And when the person responds, I have this MAC address, then the switches see where that source frame came from and it adds it to their memory table. And that's it. Great question there, Elvis. Could you use dynamic host configuration protocol? Millis, and I want you to think about what it would be like using dynamic host configuration protocol. So let's say you've got 10,000 routers in your network. And let's say they miraculously just automatically IP address themselves. And, you know, at least where it's out. And this router used to be one address, but tomorrow it's a different address. And tomorrow it's the next day. You would have a network that would be a disaster. And when you'd be trying to SSH into things to fix things and looking in the routing tables, you wouldn't even know which router you were at. Now, Millicent, I did see one person try this. And we advised them not to do this for this reason. And we said, if you do this, make sure you send your DHCP lease to infinite permanent so that it's effectively the same as a static IP address. The customer was like, yeah, 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 I'm like. So anyway. Um, I brought in some extra experts. They all said, never do this. And the customer decided, we're doing it. And the customer did it. A few weeks later, their addresses were changing. They had outages, and they couldn't even figure out where the outages were coming from. So I don't recommend dynamic anything. When you set up a server in the data center, whether it's a cloud or regular data center, you split the speed to the full or the speed to the max speed, and you set the duplex to full. And you do it on both the switch. We don't even allow auto negotiation because it causes problems. So no auto anything for anything critical. Can you, Carl, if I wanted to connect your PC and two laptops at home, would I just need to buy a switch? If all you did, Kenya Carl, was plug those three PCs in a switch, they would be fine. Now, 
if you wanted to make sure that one was yours and you could access anything, one was your child's and they could only access something, and then one was your husband's and he wanted to access everything, but you didn't want him accessing this thing because he likes to purchase exotic cats and uh, buy $5,000 cats, and you don't want him to buy $5,000 cats. You want him to rescue domestic cats from the cat store. You could put him in his own VLAN, and you could limit what he's actually able to even do. So, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And then if you wanted to connect your subnets to them, you would need a router. Exactly. And they would have to configure their router with a route back to you. Exactly. Excellent, Kenya. I don't know what you mean by drop, um, so I can't actually answer that. Um, but if you're referring to DHCP, um, we should never use it to configure a router. Why do you use Eurofair on VTY? I don't know, John. Uh, for some reason, Cisco made up those virtual terminal lines, and they're the, that's why I'm using them. Huh. Don't know otherwise why they call it that. No, listen, what if we had a bunch of devices to configure? That's why we have lots and lots of network administrators to go configure them. Yes, we're going to configure thousands of them, and they're all going to be configured manually. There's no auto anything. Raw meets too. Can we talk more about VLANs? We'll be discussing VLANs in a lot of depth throughout the course of the program. What about enabling IP routing? We're going to be doing plenty of that, Mark. We did some of it yesterday, and we're going to be doing a lot of that when we get into the routing sections. Mohammed, I don't know what you know, mean by controlling the priority number of the switch. Um, there's about a thousand different things in switches and routers that have priority numbers. Um, if you're talking about spanning tree, at some point we'll talk about setting the root bridge and setting the root port and determining these kinds of things. No, it doesn't get pre-populated. It floods until the devices respond. Chris, you can go to the next one. Is it reasonable to assume that all switches have the ability to route? No. Um, we have layer two switches, which don't have any routing capabilities. And we have layer three switches, which can do routing. And ARP is not done for routing. ARP maps an IP address to a MAC address. Routing is done via static routing protocols, interior gateway protocols, such as RIP, enhanced interior gateway routing protocol, which is you know, Cisco proprietary, so we probably don't use too much of it. OSPF is open short to pass first. IS to IS, which is intermediate systems to intermediate systems. These are routing protocols. BGP is an exterior gateway routing protocol. That's what's used to route. Um, but no, not all switches can route. But it's a good question. Linux, what is the max number of devices that can be assigned to VLAN? Well, you could potentially assign an infinite number. Once you get past 250, what happens for the most part is the systems have too many broadcasts. Art broadcast, uh, net buoy, net bios kind of stuff. Apple bonjour broadcast. Um, who's got which which uh, server message block broadcast? These systems send broadcast, broadcast, broadcast. So once you get above 250 systems, for the most part, your systems are overloaded. Um, and uh, so that's why you constrain it. I have taken VLANs up to 512 devices, but they were only very specific computers that... Uh, didn't have a lot of broadcast and they were really tuned down. And it was more of a blockchain data center. And the thing was, we had about 1,500 blockchain servers and they were dealing about 10 megs of data because everything was small little transactions. So we, we shoved 500 in the VLAN and it was worked, but we really pushed it for that. So 250 and layer three switches enable you to route between VLANs. Otherwise, you've got to connect your VLANs to a router to route between VLANs. Well, Kai goes so. So, layer one, physical layer wire. Layer two, MAC address card. Layer three, IP address. Layer four, TCP, UDP, ICMP. So, when you think about this, if IP addresses are layer three and MAC addresses are layer two, ARP, who has the MAC address of layer of a layer two thing, you can see where that protocol sits in between layer three and layer two where it's functioning. It's mapping layer three to layer two. Good question there. 
In the coming sessions, will we have information about subnetting? We will bore you to death with hours and hours and hours of subnetting. Absolutely. But we have to, we're breaking it down into certain parts. So, yes. And hours and hours on routing. To add to the question about how connecting a router with a route back to you, then how does hacking happen? So just think about it this way. The second you connect to your internet service provider, you have a default route which says send everything, everything to the internet service provider. Done. Now the internet service provider has a route back to your subnet. So that's how you're getting hacked. If you didn't have a route to the internet and they didn't have a route back to you, you couldn't connect to the internet. That's how hopping happens. But it's a good question. What is an ARP response? An ARP response is, I have the MAC address for this IP address. In other words, speaking, take a sniffer. Or go to your, if you have a Unix system or a Linux system, super user or sudo based upon the thing. Do a TCPI dump minus I and attach your Ethernet interface. And then start going to different websites. And you'll see your system will do an ARP who has the MAC address of Cisco.com. You'll see it. ARP who has the MAC address of Amazon.com. And you'll see it. You can literally see those messages unfold right before your eyes. So we're going to get back to the content in one minute. Please type C hashtag CCNA. So I know you're here, you're awake, you're alert, you're oriented. Hashtag CCNA, please. And then we'll get back to the content. And while you're typing hashtag CCNA, I can answer one question, and then we'll get back to the content. Chris, you want to bring in one more? Well, everybody's typing CCNA, so I know that everybody's paying attention awake. Raw meets too. How do you keep networking information in your head? Um, raw meat still, I got to tell you, I've been working in networking for 25 years. I will tell you that after I became a CCIE, that's when I actually started to learn networking, that all the CCNA, all the CCNP, all the CCIE stuff for me, that was just my intro to networking. See, what happened is after I became a CCIE, what happened is then people would start to bring me on the big projects. And when I got brought onto these big and massive projects, I was doing things where the, where the simple became complex. And let me tell you this. If you take something that will work and then you scale it 10,000 times greater than anybody thought it would be, unless your design is perfect, it's going to break. So raw meat stew as an architect, what do I do? I spent 99% of my career fixing things that were done by jack of all trades and a master of none. These were really, really, really smart people. I mean, in many cases, far smarter than me. But they knew a little about of a lot of things and they didn't know anything well. So what happened is every time they did something in the network, they'd break it and then they'd bring in a specialist like me to fix it. So um, that's how I got it, about 25 years worth of experience. But you're going to do well. By the end of this week or the end of next week, you're going to have good networking knowledge. Play with it for a little while, study it, work as a cloud architect, network architect, and you'll be just like me. Who knows? Maybe even better. My goal is this, for all of you to be better than me. That's why I'm here. That's why I train hard. I want you to be the best in the world, whether it be a cloud architect, network architect, network engineer, network admin, et cetera, et cetera. So, Chris, should we get back to the content at this point? I see people are popping in CCNA. I know they're awake, alert, and oriented, and that's what I care about because if you're awake, alert, and oriented, you're going to learn networking, and it's going to be fun. So we get back to the concept here, Chris. We're going to do a little more switch stuff, um, for example, just to give to walk you through a few few more things. I want you guys getting a really good um, experience out of the whole thing. And then from there, so let's go to my EVENG server. Let me see if I can find my EVENG server real quick. <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, let's walk through the content we've got over here. So now let's uh, let's play with an interface on a switch. Um, let's try to uh, make it a little clearer for you guys. So let's, uh, did we choose Cisco as the password? Yeah, we chose Cisco. So show, let's look at the running configuration and see what we've got here. Let's take a switch port we haven't touched yet and let's give some descriptions to it. So let's say this switch was a, a WAN, we were using it for the WAN. So let's go to interface, 
We can figure this. Now let's say we want to go to interface, gigabit, gigabit ethernet. Um, and let's say we saw G three slash three. Now when we're here, let's uh, let's let's do what we would normally do. We would hard code it. Duplex, we'd say full. I'll let you set on duplex full. So run. The reason it's not letting me do this, there's another configuration command in here, blocking it out. Big, let's do this. Config T interface D3 slash three. We'll do a no um, negotiation auto. I'm gonna put an IP address on it. Let's set the speed. Let's we'll put it so the speed so the speed SP. Let's set the duplex to full. So we know that speed and duplex is going to be configured. Now let's have a description on the port so we can figure description connection to AWS. So now we know what that port is doing. Now when we look at this thing and we're looking through our configurations and we don't know what's going on. And look and see if we go to that port. It didn't take it for some reason. So let's see why it didn't it config T int D three slash three description. Link to AWS. So now let's look through our running configuration. And let's see if it shows us what's going on on here. Now we know. You can see how we've selected the media type, we've selected the speed, and we've selected the duplex setting. That's how we typically set these things up. So let's walk through that. Now you can see that's realistically how we can look at these things. So now, um, should we connect these switches to another switch so we can start adding some switching and things like that? Let's add a switch, add an object, add a node. Let's add another switch. Save. Switch connects to switch. Oops. Let's add another switch here. Um, let's start the switch up. Let it come up. Which is going to take a few minutes because it's, it's, you know, these aren't the fastest devices in the world with regards to booting. Uh, no server boots up like a PC. PCs boot up fast. Servers, you know, they've got memory to check. They've got all kinds of CPU cores to check, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of stuff that goes on. Um, for example, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. The system's almost up. Ah, it's coming up. This is exciting. I love watching stuff come up. That means we can use it. Now, I want you guys to all think about this. Will the switch? And that port, gigamit 3 slash 3 that I say connection to AWS, will that port be up? If you think that port will be up, that port that I just put, port up in the chat box. And if you think that port that I just turned on, that gigabit 3 slash 3 on switch 0, on the first switch will be down, type down. Now remember, that port that I wrote the description for on switch 1, and I set the speed to 100 or 1,000 and the duplex to full. There's no cable plugged into it. So what happens to a switch port with no cable? Is it up or is it down? It's going to be down. And that's the reason why it's down. Because as you can see, there's literally nothing there. So let's draw a connection between these two switches. Connected. 
good job. Um, so now let's say we take the port that was 3-3 three, three on this one. And let's see which, see which port we're going to use. Let's say we use 0-0 zero, zero over here. So now let's think about this. Let's go to 3-3 three over three, three here on this side so we can look at it. So now we can, uh, okay, so on 3-3, three, three, show IP int brief. Now, as it turns out, GE3-3 is now up, right? Why? Because it's plugged in on the other side. It's plugged in on the other side. So now let's look at this over here, G0-0. Show IP int brief. Zero zero is up up. Now let's let's look at the let, but let's look at this. Are we happy with something? Show, so if we look at the show run, are we very happy with what we see with gig E zero zero? So on one side we negotiated speed a thousand duplex full, and on the other side we've done nothing. So we have a mismatch here, and we don't want this. So on this, we're going to go to config T. We're going to go to interface. G0 slash zero. We're going to do, write a description. Description. We're going to write a description so we know what it is. Link from AWS to data center. It's any name we want. Guess what? While we're at it, we'll do a no, we'll, we'll set this, we'll do a no negotiation auto. We'll set the speed to a thousand. Set the duplex to full. Show. Show interfaces. Oh, okay, that's too many. Okay, so wait, speed duplex mismatch. Speed duplex mismatch. Why? Why? Is, are they both hard coded or is one auto and another's not coded? So show run interface v3 slash three. Three slash o. What do we see? We see that this one is set to uh, media type RJ5D5, speed 1000, duplex full, no not a negotiation. And what do we see over here on this side? Show run int g0 slash zero. Feel like this, uh, this uh, here's what we got going on. Okay, so we've got speed and no negotiation. These two should be working, but they're not. Something's bothering them between them. So normally you'd set them, but we've got an error here. So let's go to go back to this, config T. We go to interface. And what's probably going on is I probably misconnected them. So let's look at uh, G3 slash C, G0 slash 0, and, and that should work. But for some reason, it's not like in our cabling. So we, we go back to the other words and, until we'd figure this out. So we'll go to config T. We'll go to interface, G3 slash 3. No speed, 1,000. Oops, that was, it should be 1,000. No. No. Type in negotiation. Auto. Which won't let us do because full of the duplexes. So what we have to do is it's going to tell us is we're saying no duplex. Full. Let's see if it lets us do it now. Because that's the thing. These got these routers, they guide you, which is really great. Okay, negotiation auto. So now we can look at a show run int g3 slash three. Let's see if it took our configuration. This shows us what the configuration. Okay, then that looks good. So now on this side, we've got a negotiation problem. So let's go to config. So no. Negotiation. 
go back to this port, int g0 slash 0, no negotiation, auto. I'll say so speed, no speed, 1,000, no duplex, full. Negotiation auto. Now, what's going to happen now with these two ports? Are they going to fix themselves? If we configure the right ports, yes, they will be. And if we don't configure the right ports, it's not going to look at it. So, show IP int brief. Let's see what we got on that port. Now it's up. We're not getting any more syslog management error, so I think it's wrong. So what you'll see is with these devices, they tell you when they're unhealthy and they're pretty annoying about it. Wrong, 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 wrong. So the next time you hear about an impaired network, realize there's no such thing as an impaired network. There's things that don't work right. There's a cable, there's a speed duplex, there's a routing issue, there's an IP addressing scheme. Impaired networking, it's not like routers and switches go to a bar and get drunk. I mean, it's just not what they do. Impaired networking could be anything. So now as better architects, better engineers, you'll be able to listen to cloud providers when they say things and say, does this make sense? Or no, it doesn't make sense. Because as an architect, you need to advise your customers and you need to know you can't be brainwashed, for example. So what we can do here is we can actually start looking at a port status. So if we do show. You're, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, I was a minute ago, right? Yes, you are. So if we were to do, for example, a show port. Can you move that window up a little bit? I sure can. I feel like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and this may not even allow you to look at the port status anymore, because that's the thing. Oh, it's just show interfaces. Never mind. Um, I've worked on so many Cisco devices over the years. Um, and the first ones, they were they used one set of CLI. And, and that's because Cisco bought it from another company, the Catalyst 5000. Everything was a set, a shell, it was the most beautiful thing. Then we created the iOS ones. Then we merged the iOS and the set, et cetera. And in the end, where we ended up was like 40 different sets of um, switching commands. So for a routing person like me, when we're dealing with switching, it gets pretty interesting pretty fast. So uh, Kind of let's kind of look at this. So let's look at uh, a little bit. We talked about the speed. Um, we showed you the show. So let's see if there's anything else that I want to show you while we're at it on here. So I think we're good on the, the tech piece for this. I'll be getting back to it for a second. Let's get it back to a little more content. I want to really walk you guys through this information. So when we're on those switches and I do a show IP in brief and it says administratively down, that means it was shut down and you have to do a no shutdown to turn it on. Then the interface says down, down, but not administratively down. Probably, probably because your ethernet cable was unplugged. Now this is an iPhone speaker cable, but if you've got a layer one problem, it's down, down. Now, if you have what's called an up and a down, which really isn't something we typically see on LAN switches, but it's something, it's something we constantly see working when working with the various clouds, things like Frame Relay, ISDN, for example. What'll happen is we'll turn it on, we'll get link light, which is layer one, but the line protocol or the encapsulation will be wrong. Maybe you've got a wrong Delsey and Frame Dash Relay, for example, or Maybe you're configured for point-to-point -point encapsulation, but you want to use HL HDLC. Maybe you're running Cisco HDLC versus somebody else's HDLC. So when we're dealing with encapsulation kind of problems, that's where you're going to see up and down. Now, if you're going to see down, down, and it says R disable, that's because what happened is port security disabled it. So what kind of security are we talking about that we can do on the network? Really cool stuff. So I'm looking at Eva Doikia. Eva Doikia is in my house in Florida. She comes into my house. She plugs in her computer. She gets the internet port goes up. Eva Doikia is there and everything is working great. Now, um, uh, I'm going to pick somebody that's here. I don't know Angelo. 
Um, although I've got a million relatives named Angela. It's a wonderful name. So Angela comes into my house. I don't know Angela. He plugs into my Ethernet port and an alarm goes bing, bing, bing. The port shuts down. And a bunch of Navy SEALs come from upstairs to the person to say, hey, we need to talk. So that's basically something called 802.1x, which is basically MAC address authentication. Note, we lose all those good security things in the cloud. And when you see up, up, it's working and life is good. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind when we start looking at these things on our switches and routers. That's what they actually mean. So let's uh, let's go look at interface. Let's really let's get let's let's play with it back for a minute. Let's get pretty deep into this tech. Let's actually look at one of our interfaces. So um, let's go back to nope, not back to the server. So let's do a show interface p zero slash zero. Now, we're going to get a lot of information here. What are we going to see? We're going to see that this is a gigabyte. We can see our MAC address. Now, what you see is this first part of the MAC address is called the OUI, which identifies the manufacturer of the card, which, and then the second half is the one that's unique to the device. Now, this is the description, what we manually put in here. MTU is the maximum transmission unit, meaning this link can handle a packet of up to 1,500 bytes. No bigger. So a frame of up to 1,500 bytes. Now, we can see the bandwidth in kilobits per second. We've got a delay. We've got reliability information, which we could change um, if we wanted to. A keep live is there for 10 seconds. What does that mean? It's going to reach out to the switch. Are you there? The switch is going to reach out to the device. Are you there? And it's going to say, I'm here. 10 seconds later, are you there? I'm here. 10 seconds later, are you there? I'm here. 10 seconds later, are you there? No response. 10 seconds later, are you there? No response. 10 seconds later, are you there? No response. Remove the link, set it to down. Don't send any data on this down. By doing it, guess what? You won't be sending data and losing it. So that's how these ports work. Everything has a health check. So when you're dealing with DNS and a load balancer, are you there? And the server say yes. When you're dealing with a load balancer, are you there? And the server say yes. All of this all comes from networking. This is 30, 40 year old networking technology that we now use in the cloud every day. That's what that keep alive is, auto. So we see that we've set it auto duplex, auto speed, for whatever reason with our virtualized environment, that's what it wants to use. ARP type, ARPA, basically the original kind. Um, the last time we looked at the queue, now we can see what's going on. The queuing strategy on the interface, we could change it. FIFO, first in, first out. Five minute input rate. How much data is coming in over five minutes? Averaged out. How much data is going out over five minutes? Now, do we really think we're going to get good data every five minutes? No, because we could be peaked at 100%, and realistically speaking, um, at 3% the rest of the time. And we don't know, but this gives us some information. We can um, Zero input errors means no hardware errors. Zero CRCs basically means there was no damage to the frames, um, et cetera, et cetera. Let's see what else we got over here. Um, realistically speaking, if we were in a hub, we would have things called collisions, and collisions would be a nightmare. So let's talk about the concept of a broadcast domain versus a collision domain, et cetera, because it's a pretty important concept, and I don't think anybody really makes it um, easy enough to understand. So let's walk ourselves through here. So let's look at the three alternatives, collision domains and broadcast domains. So let's say we were crazy enough to be using a hub. Are you if we were, sharing your screen? If we were crazy enough to be using hub, here's what a hub is. A hub is a box with a million and one ports on it. I've got a port over here, like a switch, but not a switch, and very different from the switch. So I know there's a certification provider that likes to call a hub a switch, but this is the problem with a hub versus a switch and why they're so very different from each other. Let's say these are all your different computers that are plugged into a hub. Now, a hub is what's called a collision domain. Now, in this, 
this hub currently speaking, and let's say we had five hubs that were strung together. We've got a hub. Let's say we've got another hub. And we've got another hub. And each one of these has, is all plugged into each other in a hub-based network, which is the worst thing ever. We've got users here. Let's, uh, let's add a couple more users on the hub. Um, I want you to really, truly understand the problem of broadcast domains versus collision domains um, versus um, and where routers and switches actually do their work. So right now, this is a hub. And let's say on the hub, who are the blue wrenches we have over here? Um, let's say over here, we've got Eva Doikia. She's got a blue wrench. And it's, who else has, uh, has a blue wrench today, Chris? Abigail has a blue wrench. Perfect. So let's say Abigail is over here. So we've got A, B, I. And not exactly the right spelling, but we're working here. So let's say that Abigail comes up with this great idea and she wants to send it to her friend Eva Doikia over there in Hungary. And she decides to send data. Now, everybody over here is also a user. As it turns out, Abby wants to send data, Eva Doikia wants to send data, and all these other users send their data. So here's what happens. They're connected to a hub, which is basically shared medium. Everybody talks and everybody sees everybody else's traffic. Now. If Abby and Eva Doikia or any one of the thousands or hundreds of people that are sitting on this hub transmitted data at the same time, we get a warning. Warning, beep, 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 all data stops because the data collided. So then what happens is every one of your computers ran them back off, ran them back off. And then guess what? Abby and Joey try to transmit at the same time. And guess what? Uh, 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 not allowed, back off. So then... Uh, Randomly, they all back off, and Eva Dykia sends her traffic, and it gets through. Life is good. All's good. Now, she's sending her traffic to Abigail. It's all getting through, and now um, uh, Sam starts submitting traffic at the same time. Now, Abigail's disconnected. Eva Dykia's disconnected, and Sam's disconnected. And now everybody waits, and they all try and retransmit, and then 30 people try and retransmit at the same time. That's what a collision domain is, where your traffic can, can, will collide. Now. When you deal with um, wireless, it's all collision domains, which is why your wireless can save 50 gigs and you're not going to get more than 500 megs because the collisions basically give you about 10% of the capacity that you would actually get. So that's what a collision domain was. Now, remember, if this turns into a switch, everything changes. So now we're in a, a switch. Now, the things are different on the switch, and I'll show you why. Switch. And I'll show you where routers come into play. Now we've got this switch over here. This is a really good setup. Now we've got users here. So Eva Dykia wants to see a picture of Abigail's beautiful cat, Noni. And it's one of the most beautiful cats I've ever seen. So she sends a request, Eva Dykia, I'd like to see it. Now, the first frame, ARP, who has the MAC address of Abigail's computer, does get broadcast out oh, oh, all these ports and all these ports, and out Abigail's port. Now, Abigail says, I have it. Now, all the traffic going between Abigail and Eva Doikia goes through. All these other users can be sending each other's traffic to each other. It's not a problem because on a switch, it's not a shared medium. A switch is not half duplex where you send and receive on the same wire. It's full duplex. You send on one set of wires or receive on another set of wires. The switches... Don't allow unknown traffic out our ports so the data never collides. So each port on a switch is its own collision domain. So basically, uh, 10 hubs strung together is one collision domain. One port in a switch is its own. So by using a switch, we don't have any problems. We don't have collisions. We get the maximum throughput. Now where do routers come in? So I'm going to show you the difference. Now, got a router over here. And this is why routers are so cool. But let's say we've got three VLANs over here. We've got Evo and a VLAN. And uh, let's say we've got Chris and another VLAN. And 
In addition to that, we got Leo in a separate VLAN. They're all in different VLANs. Get rid of all this nonsense over here. Let's keep a couple of these. So let's keep Abigail over here. Now, while we're at it, um, let's say we got my buddy Alonzo. Alonzo's over here. Get rid of all these things. Now we put a router in between them. Now, these are all different subnets. So the router is going to route between the subnets. So while the router is routing between the subnets, I want you to think about how much coolness we have now. So we've got this router routing between subnets. You know, this is not my, my prettiest architectural diagram, but it is what it is. And we've got a router routing in between subnets over here. Let's call this a router. Now let's think about how much cool stuff we can do. Alonzo and I are collaborating in a cloud engineering program. He's my good buddy. So Alonzo, oh wait, I never put me in here. Hold on, let me add me. Alonzo wants to reach me. Alonzo's in one VLAN. Now, in order to get from his VLAN to my VLAN, he has to go to through this through a router. So Alonzo has a route to me. And because Alonzo has a route to Mike, he can reach me. Now, because it's a router, I've got a layer three access list that says Alonzo can reach this on my subnet. I can now say Alonzo can reach my one server. Alonzo can't reach anything. I can lock Alonzo down into port 22 coming into me on my router with an access list on the router. I can't do any of that coldness on the switch. I can then say, Leo and Chris need to talk to each other, but Chris needs access to the most sophisticated parts of our company because he's my chief operating officer. And Leo only needs to know the top 80%. So I can create a policy between Leo and Chris so that Leo gets 80% of what he needs. I get 100% and Chris gets what we need. So by bringing in routers, we take the broadcast domain and every port on a router is its own broadcast domain because it's its own subnet. So in a routed network, we can grow and grow and grow because how many people can we put in a subnet? 250 to 500 max. And beyond that, it's all lost. So we can't keep creating VLANs of 10,000 users. We can create a VLAN of 200 users, a VLAN of 200 users, a VLAN of 200 users, or one user, it doesn't matter. And we can route between them. But because of the routing, that enables us to do things like access control list and filtering and things. So we enable ourselves with routing to be able to do so many cool things. And that's the difference between a router, a switch, and a hub. So now we're gonna start doing some VLANs. Chris, how long have we talked about this since the last break? About 30 minutes. Okay, let's take a break then. Let's cover some concepts. So Chris, hopefully you've been capturing the questions. And I will bring up StreamYard so I can see the questions and let's answer some questions. I want everybody to have a wonderful free CCNA experience um, because I want everybody to get a cloud architect job or solution architect job. Why are switches named switch? Angela, we name them whatever we want. By default, they come and they say switch, so you can identify it as a switch. Um, but realistically speaking, you should have a naming convention. Every company has their own naming convention and you make one, but you can name it anything you want. What is the difference between a VLAN and a subnet? Tony D, each VLAN is a group of ports or a switch or switches, but each VLAN has to be in its own subnet. So. The subnet, which we'll have lots of time talking about, is an IP network that's broken down into a fraction of that IP network. And we'll spend probably two to three days talking about subnetting. But understand this, that each interface on a router needs to be on a different subnet. And that means that each VLAN also needs to be on a different subnet. So we'll spend lots of time on the mathematical calculations of subnetting and uh, definitely, definitely cover that in depth. But great question. Eva Doik, you might. Collision domains happen when the data is transmitted at the same time. And it only affects hubs because they're half duplex. Yes, but because it's not just half duplex, they're all sharing. What is a hub? It's basically two wires or it goes out, a couple wires that goes out of report. So everybody's seeing everything. 
So that is the reason. So yes, it's half duplex, but by nature, because all the ports can see every bit of electrons that go on the wire, that's why it's shared. So everybody's talking and everybody can see each other's traffic. But on a switch, if you're plugged into one port, I can't on another port see your traffic. So realistically speaking, and now that, that's really a good point. So let's talk about, let's, uh, wow, Ibadoike, that's a really good question. So let me bring in another slide. Because I really, really like that question. Um, so realistically speaking, if this becomes a hub, what happens is when a packet comes in, that packet literally hits every single device at, at, at the same time that's in here. So it's literally getting sent to everybody. And since it's duplex, it's half duplex, it creates this environment. But the point is, is the way CSMA, CD, collision detection, collision multi-avoidance networks work and the way they were designed is that exponential back off strategy. And that's the way Wi-Fi works, which is why Wi-Fi's performance is so bad and you would never use it for servers. Because when this comes in, everybody over here all sees the same thing. Now, if this becomes a switch, and you know, we've got you over here instead of a router, and we've got me over here wanting to send you a, a photo of my cat Cindy, or Cindy got a hold of my phone and she sends it to you. When you get that message from Cindy, yeah, the first packet may go out all these things, but they're full duplex, so it doesn't cause a problem. And then as, as soon as you respond, Cindy's just sending their, your traffic to you. So guess what? If you're on this port, you can't see the traffic on this port. And if you're on this port, you can't see the traffic on this port. So what do we actually have to do when we want to actually see what's going on in the network in a switched environment? We actually have to create a special kind of port. And I'm going to show you what that port looks like. We create a port, and we typically call it a span port, S-P-A-N, and I don't know why Cisco made, I'm sure it has an acronym. And what happens is the span port is where we plug in a computer, and let's call it, we'll call it a sniffer, and, a, or, and it's basically a protocol, let's call it a protocol analyzer, so that's the right term. So what happens is we can create something called the span port, and what the span port will do is it'll recreate, it'll take all the traffic on all the other ports, and it'll send it out the span port so you can run your network analysis tools, but you would never plug a device into there because it's like a hub. So when you're dealing with switch environments which have security, and the whole point is to make sure people can't see each other's traffic, if you need to see the traffic for analysis, you have to create another kind of thing which replicates it to, so your protocol analyzer can see it. So I hope I answered that question for you, Vindoikia. And then Chris, if you want to bring in the next one. Um, if you had a layer three switch, you wouldn't need a router in the middle of the, route. the layer three switch. You, what happened is you still have your VLANs. And then what would happen is we would create an interface for the VLANs, which is just the router part. So yes, routers would do the same thing. And a layer three switch is a router. A layer two switch is a switch. A layer three switch is a router. That just can combine switching and routing functions. All switches broadcast the first packet out all ports until, until they actually learn the port where the MAC address is, and then they send it directly to the, Mac, the port um, where the MAC address resides. So only thing that switches use all ports, and switches use MAC address tables. So they broadcast out all ports, and as soon as the person responds with the MAC address, the switch only sends it between the sender and the receiving ports. So that's what we're really talking about. Brian, um, we would never use a hub. Um, I don't think you could even buy a hub for 20 reasons. The only reason I brought up the hub is one of the AWS certification providers that's very famous, tells everybody that a hub and a switch are the same. And then when people get asked these questions in job interviews, they can't get hired. So that's the reason I'm talking about it. Um, we don't use hubs. The only place where we actually use the equivalent of a hub is Wi-Fi. And the reason we're using the equivalent of a hub for our Wi-Fi is we don't really have an option. We've got an access point that sits on the ceiling and we've got hundreds of computers that need to do this. And it's not like we can have a, a different radio frequency for every single user to keep them all separately. So that's why Wi-Fi is effectively the same as a hub, which goes back to 30, 40 year old technology, which is Wi-Fi. So, you know, 
That's why we never plug in a server over wireless. That's why we never do anything important over wireless. And that's why um, we hard code everything for those reasons. Good question there, Brian. You've heard the term, but what is payload? Well, okay, so you got a car. It's got a trunk or a boot based on what country it is. You stick it in the trunk, you drive the car. The stuff that's in your trunk, that's your payload. The data that's in the frame, that's the payload. So you put passengers on an airplane, a thousand passengers, they are the payload. The payload is whatever you're transporting. Good question there, John. You can connect VLAN to VLAN, or you can connect VLAN to router, either. Good question, though. Why do you need a routing table? Well, if you got in a car and you wanted to know the destination, you'd have to know how to get there. That's what a routing table does. It's like the GPS in your car. Go straight, make a left, make a right, make a right, go late. If you don't know how to get there, you'll never get there. Routing table is your map. Chris, want to bring in the next one? AK, how does domain name service work? Well, we will have a small DNS section that we'll cover, but realize DNS is not a network engineering thing. DNS is typically a sysadmin thing. It's typically done by your Unix people or your Linux people. But having said all that, we will discover or discuss uh, domain name systems, and we'll go over it when we get to the section of the curriculum that does include that. So we will get to it. You can't use one gig base T without not being full duplex. It's a laser. So, um, I'm so, I'm, so if you're using 10 G base T, which is laser, you're gonna have a send laser and you're gonna have a receive laser. There's no possibility to make it um, uh, not full duplex. Why do you need a broadcast domain? Well, there's no option. That's the way Ethernet was set up. So unless we want to redo Ethernet and redo all of networking, we have no choice. That's the way it works. We have a broadcast domain. Basically, everybody in a broadcast domain can see each other's broadcasts. So ARP, who has the MAC address, requires a broadcast. Hey, I have a message here, um, one of the Microsoft messages. That's how servers identify each other. Um, everything requires broadcast. So if we don't have broadcast domain, we have no networking. But that's the way the networking protocols were set up 50 years ago, and that's why we still have them. Does the term dumb hub? Not really, because you know, hubs don't exist for 20 years now. And what is the difference between a smart switch and a dumb switch? Well, if you go to Best Buy, you can buy a switch that's not a smart switch. Every other switch in the entire world is considered a smart switch. What is the difference? If it can put VLANs on it or you can manage it, it's considered a smart switch. So there is no such thing in networking as a smart switch because there is no switch that's not smart in networking. Now, for a user in their home, you can buy a $30 device that's not considered a smart switch, but that's about it. All switches are smart switches. Now, layer two switches just do switching. Layer three switches do switching and routing, but uh, no, none of that stuff is applicable. Unless you're dealing with the consumer space. Hubs and switches are entirely different technologies and they can never be used to simulate each other. I would say that a hub is if you took a box and you plugged an identical wire out every single port so that when an electrical signal comes in on every single part, it goes out all ports. That's what I would say a hub is. That's why we don't use them and haven't used them for 20 years because what happens is all your users try and talk at the same time and then nobody is allowed to talk. So imagine a hub is like this. A hub is like going to a busy dinner table that's got 60 people in the table and everyone's screaming all at the same time, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. So that's why we don't use hubs anymore. The switch is basically like this. Mike and Chris can talk. Evo and Abigail can talk. Pritipal and Aguilo can talk. Elvis and Earl can talk and they can talk to each other, and you can't hear anybody else's stuff. So that's why people use switches. That's why we stopped using hubs about 20 years ago. The only thing left of a hub is Wi-Fi, and that's why we can't use Wi-Fi for anything important. I'm sure we will spend some time talking about spanning tree and rapid spanning tree, 
And when we do that, we will go over spanning tree terminology and the spanning tree protocol and the spanning tree elections and the algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. But trying to explain one thing out of context. Dan, what is the typical limit of your standard home grade switches and enterprise switches? Um, home grade switches, you know, they don't have much of anything. And I have no knowledge of home-based networking. Um, people don't pay me to design, you know, their Wi-Fi in their home. And let's be fair, I've never designed a system where I could go to Best Buy or, or uh, Staples and pick up a hub um, or a switch to that. So I don't know anything about home networks. Now, big core switches? Remember, they're going to be handling millions of routes in the routers. And a lot of those are switches, so they can store thousands of MAC addresses like nothing. Nothing. Hundreds of thousands of them, too. But realistically speaking. Um, best way I can describe it is if you've got a thousand people at a table talking to each other, um, you're going to have congestion. If you've got a million cars on the highway at the same time, you're going to have congestion. So... That's why. Router and switching configurations are very different because routers are dealing with routing and switches are dealing with switching. So switching will include things like VLANs and routing will include things like routing protocols like BGP and OSPF. So they're going to be very different. Now, a lot of the commands will be similar because they're made by the same people, but the technology and what we're doing are very different. Okay, so let's get back. Before we get back to the content, everybody type hashtag CCNA, and then I know you're ready. Because it's kind of hard, and I know that way I know you're not sleeping while we're talking about these things. So let's talk about VLANs and making VLANs, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna talk about VLAN concepts. We'll talk about VLAN and VLAN trunking, configuration and verification, and we'll be doing some troubleshooting of some VLANs. Excellent, I know you're awake now because of the CCNA that you're typing. So, and again, I want everybody passing the CCNA 200-301 exam, but more importantly, I want you to get hired. I want you to be capable. I want the world to come to you, and I want the world to know your name as great. Network administrators, network engineers, cloud architects, solutions architects, network architects, let's have some fun. So let's realistically talking about this. What we can do is as follows. Is we can take our switches, switch one over here, switch two. And we, by keeping them separate, we can have a broadcast domain, but we could take a single switch and we could chop it up. So I like using this example and I like uh, creating my own whiteboard stuff on the fly sometimes. Imagine this, now we've got a switch. Switch. Here we go. Get rid of the, let's change the color of the text because we're gonna have fun with this. Um, let's change the text color to black. Let's make sure there's no fill over here. So now we've got a switch. Now, a VLAN is just this. Chop the switch. We'll make this mini switch one. And uh, let's do this. We're gonna make mini, we're gonna make mini switch two inside of the switch. Now we're gonna make mini switch three. And then we're going to get involved and talk about what these things are. But I just want to walk you through a high-level architectural overview first. And then let's say we've got switch four. Now, in this switch, this switch, this switch, this switch, and this switch cannot talk to each other because they're all their own VLANs. That's why it's a virtual switch. This cannot talk to this, who cannot talk to this, who cannot talk to this. Now, if we had a router between them, we could route between VLAN 1 and VLAN 2 versus VLAN 2 and 3 versus 2 and 1 and 2 and 4, et cetera, et cetera. We can do that with a router, but they're all in different subnets and they can't talk to each other. We are secure and it's fun. Okay, so we're secure, life's good, things are working. Now, 
let's say over here, switch one. Let's say this is finance. And let's say switch two is accounting. And let's say switch three is development. And let's say switch four is uh, production. Now, everything's in one switch. Wait, I need more ports. I ran out of ports on that switch. Okay, now, what could we do? We could create, we could buy another switch. Okay, now we've got another switch. Now, what if we've grown so much that I need to hire some more people for finance? I need to hire some more people for, for accounting. I need to hire some more developers and I need to hire some uh, more production servers. So now we've got two switches. Now we have two options. Switch one and switch two can't talk to each other right now. Now we could make switch one, VLAN one talk to VLAN two by doing this, by running a cable between VLAN one and VLAN two. And then we could also run another cable from switch one over to here to switch two. And then we could run a cable between this VLAN over here and this VLAN over here. And then I could run a cable from switch four to virtual switch four. Everybody's talking to everybody. VLAN one can talk to VLAN one because they're in the same subnet and same VLANs. VLAN two can talk to VLAN two, great. VLAN three, VLAN three, VLAN four, VLAN four. But is there any problems here? Well, no. I've got four fiber optic connections and I can cross the switch. Now let's think about this with a little more complexity. Now let's think about it this way. Now let's say this is in building one. Now let's say this switch is in building two. Now let's say there's a kilometer between building one and building two. A kilometer. Now I'm not gonna go out there I'm not going to get my cheap little cable and plug it in. Not one bit. Why? It's not going to stretch. An Ethernet cable or copper is good. What? 100 meters? So now i got a problem. So, but I've got fiber buried under the ground. So I can now, I now have one piece of fiber between point A and point B. But let's say it's a powerful fiber. It's 100 gig fiber. So I've got lots of speed that I can do between buildings. 100 gig. I've got a single fiber. So now, what if I could take the information from VLAN 1, take it, somehow miraculously put it on this piece of fiber, get it back to VLAN 1, and then I could take the information from VLAN 2 on this one wire and somehow get it to VLAN 2 while not letting it see VLAN 1. And then I could take the stuff from switch 3 and I can move it to VLAN three, and then I could take the stuff from four to four. Now I've extended my VLANs and I've extended my users across buildings. And I did it with a single strand of fiber. I did it with a single connection. And what is that called? That's called trunking. What is trunking? It enables you to put multiple VLANs on a wire. And we're gonna talk about it a lot. We'll talk about 802.1Q at some point. We'll talk about framing, but that's what a switch is. We take a switch, we chop it up, we've created our VLANs. We want to route between VLANs, we need a router. We want to connect our VLANs and our switches to switches. What are we doing? We're connecting them via something called a trunk port. What is a trunk port? It enables you to securely put multiple VLANs. So for those of you guys that are out there in the cloud computing space, and you buy a direct, you buy a private line to whatever that point of presence is, direct connection location is, whatever you want to call it, and they run a cable to their switch, and they make you send them a VLAN. Why? They've got a trunk port going back to the AWS or the Azure network, and they're sticking your stuff on that trunk port, and they're separating you by your 802.1Q VLAN tag from everybody else. That's the kind of thing we're actually talking about. So now you know. Chris, I did share the screen for that, right? Yes, you did. Okay, perfect. So we'll show you some more professional images that my team made, which look a little more professional than I would draw. 
So you can see we've got uh, Chris and Laman in one VLAN, and we've got Evil and me in another VLAN, and Evil and me can talk to each other, and Chris and Laman can talk to each other, but Chris and I, and Laman and I can't speak to each other because we don't have a router. And that gives you a, a pretty good environment. Again, if it's multi-switch, it's going to be the same thing. Nothing changes. You know, you've got here, you've got users plugged into one switch versus another switch. And you could have a cable per VLAN, or you could have a trunk port, just like I showed you. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so now let's talk about what's actually going on on this VLAN trunk. So let's have a little bit of fun with it. We're talking about some multi-switch configuration. Apologies. I've got too many windows open on my three monitors over here. It's a little bit challenging. So here's how that wire works. When the information goes from the VLAN, the VLAN adds this thing called the dot one Q tag. And this dot one Q tag puts a tag on it. So this VLAN was tagged VLAN 20. This one was tagged VLAN 10. This one was VLAN 20. This is 10. So what happens is the switch on the far end does the following. It removes the tag in places where it wants to be. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So let's look at a little more. Port sent, untagged, it leaves, it gets tagged. It gets sent across. So what's this kind of tag look like? Well, it looks like this. Remember everything I told you was called encapsulation where you take your stuff and you just smack a label on it or you smack an IP header or a TCP header. And at each stage, you just put a little more stuff along the way. Same thing on VLAN trunking. What do you do? You take your ethernet frame, destination, source address, remember, type, data, frame check sequence, and you slap on a tag. It's a VLAN identifier. It's a 12-bit tag, that's it. And now, when you put this VLAN tag on, the switch knows, left VLAN two, because it's got VLAN two, received by switch two in VLAN two, strip off the VLAN two tag, Drop the packet, or I'm sorry, the frame in VLAN 2, and everybody's talking to everybody. That's what trunking is. So <clears throat> we'll keep that in mind. Now remember, with layer 2, VLANs can't talk to you. So I had some people drawing some Flintstones thing. You know, the Flintstones, maybe you're too young for the Flintstones, but many of us loved it. Um, and whatever, we had these Stone Age characters with dinosaurs and cats, and we put Fred and Dino. Um, on one VLAN and Wilm and Betty on another VLAN, and they couldn't talk to each other without a router, without a router. So what will ultimately happen is if we stuck a router here and we plugged, uh, uh, we, we took this VLAN and plugged it into one port on a router, and this VLAN plugged it into another port on the router and gave an IP address to each subnet, then guess what? We'd route between those VLANs. So. We're going to show you lots of ways to route between VLANs through this program with routers, with the scary thing that I haven't seen in 20 years called router on a stick, but it's on every CCNA exam. So we'll talk about it. And then there's this, but, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And when I talk about router on the stick, I want you to understand that's from the old days when routers could push a mega traffic on a $5,000 router. So, I mean, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. You know, these are the kind of things that you're talking about. So. Um, let's talk about how to set up VLANs. So we'll configure some VLANs, we'll play with it, um, and uh, we'll look at it. So let's go back to our EVE and G server. Okay, actually help me if I would get on the, on the uh, right window, bear with me, everyone. So let's get on our EVE and G server. Let's, uh, let's wipe the config that we have on this. So uh, for realistically speaking, we'll wipe them all. And the reason I want to do that is I want to just play with it. So let's start this router. And once it comes up, we'll, uh, we'll have a little fun with it. Um, let's bring the other one up just so the port goes up. Start this while we're at it. Let's let the one device come up. And it's like Jeopardy. Do, 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 do. Or however that song went, I'm sure somebody remembers that. But the point is, is we're going to be here. We're going to wait for the switch to come up, and we're going to create a VLAN. And you know what? Maybe we'll put some ports in that VLAN so we can see it. 
router came up. You can see uh, around the time that the operating system for this router is, it's about five years old, um, which, you know, for me is uh, not uh, that complicated. So we're not that old. So I'm used to seeing stuff that says made in, you know, 1989, 1993, you know, those kind of things. So, you know, when I see 2015, it feels brand new to me, um, even though it's a couple of years. So let's go to this router or the switch. Let's, uh, let's give it a nice name. Oh, this is going to drive us nuts. So config, let's say config T. And uh, um, I don't want to see every single message. So let's do no logging console. And that way it won't drive us batty. Because um, otherwise we're going to see a million and one things going across our screen. Now let's give it a different host name, config T. Why do I keep doing all this basic stuff each time? Because at some point you guys are going to remember it. We're already there. Let's change the host name to a switch one. Okay, we changed the host name. Now let's create a VLAN. Created a VLAN by naming it. Let's name it. Name. Call it Fred's VLAN. Now it's got a name, we can find it. Now, let's add some ports to this, ER, this VLAN. So let's look at the ports that are on this device. So interfaces. We can't add ports that we don't actually have. Um, well, we got a whole bunch of gigabit ethernet, three slash three, so that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so let's just do this. Let's take gig interface. So let's, uh, let's make, an access port versus a trunk port. So we're going to do this. We're going to type interface, we'll add some ports to a VLAN. So let's say config the terminal. And uh, then let's say we change it to a switch port mode. Let's get in there. And we have to get to the port. Um, let's get to the interface. Let's say G0 um, slash zero. And let's add a couple ports to the VLAN. All the way to G0 slash three. I think this will let us do this. Um, oh, I'm, I know what I'm doing wrong. I forgot the range command. Access means where users are going to plug in. I think that should be enough. So let's do this. Show VLAN. can see um, what we did is we set up this VLAN and you can see the ports that we placed inside of that VLAN. So now you know how we add ports to a VLAN. That's exactly what we're doing. Now by comparison, let's, uh, you want to see what it looks like in the running configuration. So we can do a show run. Basically look at the, configure the show, consider the show run to be the thing that's real, their show running config, that's really gonna be helping you out constantly because this is where you're gonna be see where you mess something up. So, you know, these are one of these kind of things, um, makes life a little more complicated, but you know, we wanna make sure you're all doing great. So um, you can see it through the show run, Tri no AAA new model, what's that mean? No authentication whatsoever, not good. What is AAA? Authentication, who are you? Authorization, what are you allowed to do? And accounting, what have you done? Well, what do we call that in the cloud? Identity and access management, make it complicated. What is it? Who are you? What are you allowed to do? And what did you do? You know, we networking people make life simple, 
our wealth is so complicated we can't afford to make things obvious we can't afford to make things complicated so kind of keep this in in the back of your mind that's what we're talking about here so let's have a little more fun with these switches um let's create another one where we're at it um let's have fun let's create another vlan i want you guys to become an expert so what are we going to do we're going to go back we'll config t um now let's go and uh does you, anybody remember the ports that we have sitting on this device? Because we got, okay, so let's say we're going to go from, we're going to add these ports now to another VLAN. Gigabit Ethernet 1 slash 0123. So let's look at this. Here, what are we going to do? We're going to have fun. We're going to do inter, let's say we say interface, gigabit Ethernet, and let's do interface range, G 1 slash 0 all the way to 3. Okay, we're there. Let's make it an access port. Switch port. Access. Great. I think we have to do switch port mode access. Guess what? Work now. Show VLAN. You can see it's there. You can see we've added the ports to the VLAN. Now you know pretty basic stuff. Pretty basic stuff. So now you know that basically how we're setting these things up. Now let's talk about some trunking things. Um, when we talk about trunking things, because we're going to talk about now how we create trunks at some point. So remember this: an access port where you plug into the switch, maybe the user. A trunk port, switch to switch. Now. There's this concept of all this auto negotiation, auto trunking in between switches. And I kind of hate auto auto anything, but these switches run it. There's basically two forms of trunking that we can be talking about. We can talk about the Cisco ISL trunking and we'll probably talk about it at some point. And that is really cool trunking stuff, but why won't we use it? It's Cisco proprietary. And even when I worked at Cisco for a decade and I was teaching Cisco engineers how to do stuff, I would never recommend any proprietary service. So what kind of tagging will I be recommending? 802.1Q tagging. Why? Because it works with Cisco, Juniper, AWS, Azure, and everybody. And I never use stuff that's vendor proprietary because it's like a prison sentence. You are locked in and you can't leave. And I don't do that to anybody. So. Remember the concept of dynamic desirable. And what this does is it initiates negotiation messages to de determine which VLANs and things are going to be a trunk. And we can also go dynamic auto, which is basically where it's just going to be sit there and it's going to wait for stuff to actually do this. Keep that in the back of your mind when we start talking about trunking. So we've got an environment, for example, as I showed you, where you've got two switches um, pretty much we're going to be talking about the things in between these switches. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now, there's still lots of shops that are using ISL trunking. I see it all the time, but I would never, never recommend it for these reasons. But like I said, I can walk into 30 or 40% of the businesses out there, and we're still going to see it in use today, even though we should not. So... The initial state when you set up two switches between them is gonna be just switch port, not trunking. But at some point they will negotiate in between them. So let's kind of create a trunk between two switches. Now, 99% of my career, I'm gonna tell you, um, with a number, a CCI number of 7417, and being Mr. BGP for most of these companies, I don't do a lot of stuff on the, uh, you know, on the switching side. Most of the stuff that I do has been, you know, advising ISPs on their BGP, their traffic engineering, their label switching, their RSVP signaling. So that's kind of my world. So I'll go over the switching with you, but you know, we're going to make sure the routing sections are really, really fun for you because you know that's what network architects like me do after 25 years. But you know, we'll be working on this. So. Let's say we want to actually change these switches and we want to create a trunk. No big deal. We're going to go to the port. We're going to talk about it and we're going to create the trunk and it's going to be, say, desirable or not desirable. So let's say we wanted to do this. So 
Um, let's remove um, the G00. So let's, let's not do this. Let, yes. Make sure to share your screen if you're about to do something. Sounds good. So let's go wipe this configuration again, just because we want to have some fun here. And it'll be easier to wipe our, e our configuration on the EVENG node than it'll be to start playing with it. Plus, it gives us a chance to just sort of play. And playing is fun. It's how we learn. We'll start it up. Of course, it'll take some time. They'll boot up. They're a little slow. So we can play the Jeopardy music if we had it in the background. Do, 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 do. Well, while we wait. And I got to tell you, while we're waiting, I've seen organizations that have these big switch networks where they've got VLAN trunks everywhere and they dealt with spanning tree and rapid spanning tree, which we'll talk about. I got to tell you, it's ugly. I got to tell you, for the most part, for the last 25 years, I've helped rip out all this trunking and all this layer two nonsense and replace it with layer three things for high security, higher availability, more rapid self-healing, et cetera. So I don't do a lot of layer two networks for that reason. I generally try to remove them. Now, people like them because they're simple, but you know there's so much that goes wrong with all these broadcasts and spanning trees and rapid spanning trees. It's so much easier for me to make a nice network, turn on OSPF or intermediate systems, intermediate systems, turn on some RSVP signaling and some label switching, create some primary explicit and backup paths, and I can give my customer a 40 millisecond recovery around pretty much anything. So, you know, I don't see a lot of use for doing these layer two things, but there are times where you're working at a small company that have huge switch networks. You're at a university, huge switch network. You're a medium sized business that doesn't have 30 CCIEs on staff. Guess what? You know, that's kind of the concept. So keep that in the back of your mind. You will see switch stuff out there, especially in small companies. So let's go, to, let's go, go back to this. So let's uh, P. So while we're here, let's do uh, let's let's do no logging console because I don't feel like being harassed. I'll buy this stuff. Let's set an enable password. Of course, we'll pick the world's most famous internet password, which is guess what? Um, um, there, um, realistically speaking. Then let's say we want to go to interface. So while we're at it, let's go to interface G0 slash zero. Let's do make it a switch port, trunk port, switch port mode, dynamic, fireable, control Z. And what you'll see now is this is actually a trunk port that we actually set up. you can see it now you can see this you can look at it um, so what are you seeing you can see that it's g0 slash zero you can see that it's the dynamic desirable trunk you can see the trunking encapsulation is to negotiate and it's on a negotiation you can see right now that the only vlan on the trunk is one because that's the only vlan we configured in this brand new switch we're not using private vlans what are private vlans private vlans are awesome Awesome. They enable me to have 10 devices in a VLAN and not talk to each other. So think about it this way. You can't do this in the cloud, but you can in your data center. 50 servers sitting in a VLAN. Server one gets infected with malware, but it's in a private VLAN and server one can't talk to server two in the same VLAN. Security. Can't do that on a cloud, but you know, when we know the cloud, we know we have less security and we accept less security in the cloud and we use other things for security in the cloud. Um, but we just know these things. So Keep that in the back of your mind. Now we've got uh, a little bit of concept of what we've actually done with regards to creating trunk ports. So, you know, we're there, we're having fun, we're dealing with trunking. Now, we should probably show you what this looks like. Typically speaking, wrong one, if we're dealing with a voice over IP environment, what do we do? We typically create a trunk port from the switch to the user's desk. So what happens is the phone has a switch in it and the phone will create, will have one VLAN, which goes to the, the switch and it'll have another VLAN for your data. And why do you do this? 
you separate your voice traffic over your data traffic. So let's think about this. If you're if you have an emergency and you try and place a phone call and you can't make that call, it's a problem, right? I mean, a huge problem. So by comparison, let's pretend, for example, that what you really needed to do was as follows. You wanted to prioritize the voice traffic. So if you had a worm or a virus, your voice you could call tech support. Hey, it's Mike. My systems are down. Now, if you have voice over IP and you don't have QoS enabled, you can't. So typically speaking, we segregate our voice traffic from our data traffic. We stick them on different VLANs, and that's the reason. So when we're dealing with voice over IP environments, uh, just to walk you through what it's going to look like, we got our switch in the wiring closet. Plugs into the phone, which has got it switched. Now, this is plugged into the network on its own one VLAN, and this is trunked on another VLAN. So that's kind of what we're talking about. So let's play with this a little more. So we've got a switch. Got two VLANs. VLAN one voice. VLAN two data. No big deal. No big deal. All good. So how would we look into this environment? So if we wanted to do this, if we wanted to deal with a phone, for example, how would we create it? How would we set up this environment to work with voice over IP? Well, we do it like over here. So we'd find, um, what we'd have to do is first create some VLAN. So let's create a VLAN. So let's create a VLAN. Hold on. Well, let's go to VLAN 11, for example, and let's uh, let's pop some interfaces in here. All right, let's look at the show interfaces on this before I do this and show. Anybody remember which port we created as a trunk port? If not, well, let's go look at the running configuration to make sure we remember. I don't see where we configured it. Um, so let's make sure I can, I just want to see what we put in here. Okay, so we've configured uh, gigabit zero, zero to be the trunk. Um, so let's say we want to take um, all of these things, the gigabit zero, one slash three, et cetera, um, that line card, let's, uh, let's, create a let's create a different trunk. So, Configure another one, we'll go config T. We'll do this, uh, VLAN 11. Here what we'll say is interface. Okay, never mind. let me get back out of this. So we'll say um, interface range D1 slash zero to three. A switchboard mode access. And then under here, we could do switchport access VLAN 10. Let's say we got, we're going to create a VLAN 11 for our users. And that's how we would create a voice and a data VLAN on the switch. Just to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And then what we can do is we can actually look at our interface. So So interfaces, um, G0 slash zero, switch port. It's gonna show us, it's gonna show us that it's it's a trunk port that we set up, which VLANs are enabled, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Um, we can do show interfaces trunk. You can see what you're, what you're trunking. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we could get a little more there. 
We could show interfaces. We could do G0 slash zero. I think we set that up as a trunk port as well. And we could see exactly what we set up there. So, you know, that's what we're doing. It's giving you the position to, to be able to look and see what's going on. Um, done lots and lots and lots of voice networks. And when I started doing voice networks, it was interesting. I started doing voice networks to cut the cost between phone calls between, say, New York and London or New York and Delhi or um, San Jose and Bangalore. That's what it started with. What did it turn into? Expert networks, SIP presence, the ability to create environments to get who you wanted when you need them. And it became really, really cool. And, and when, when voice over IP became unified communications, wow, that's when we could really use this to basically show our customers so many things. Let's walk through a couple more commands while we're at it, and then uh, we'll take some questions. So let's look at the show VLANs, show VLANs, brief, walk you through it. You can see the VLANs, give you some concepts. Um, you know, now you kind of understand the concept of a VLAN. We've got VLANs that are here. So show, so we look at these VLANs so we can, we, can, we can make sure the VLANs are active. If not, we would do a no shutdown on them. And we could shut down a VLAN we wanted if we wanted. So let's go to, can, at least we used to be able to. So big T, interface, or we should say VLAN 10. Should be able to shut it down. At least we used to be able to. Now, if we do this, the same question, show VLAN brief, notice that we shut it down. So I hope uh, that makes sense. The next section, I hate it. It is spanning tree. I think spanning tree is the most ugly, ugly protocol in the world. I have 25 years experience of getting rid of spanning tree with layer three links. So. I think we all know exactly my level of happiness with regards to spanning tree, but we need to know about it and we need to take some questions first. So everyone, as part of your Cisco Certified Network Associate class, your CCNA 200-301, free CCNA training 200-300-1, day two, let's bring in some questions right now. So Chris, bear with me to, for a second to pull up StreamYard. So I can see the questions and I look forward to answering some questions. Can you have the same VLAN and two switches? Absolutely. That's the whole point of all this trunking that we're talking about, to have the same VLAN and two switches. Absolutely. Can I clarify, Ivodikia, can I clarify against layer two security and layer three? Absolutely. So at layer two, we can add QoS to the port meaning we can determine that we send critical data over non-critical. Let me tell you about security. Having QoS attached to your port, which we can do at layer two and layer three, huge, huge thing. At layer two, we can do something called 802.1x authentication, which basically means if you don't have the right MAC address, you're shut off. At layer two, we can have a MAC address access control list that says your MAC address can talk to my MAC address, but nobody else's MAC address. We can do that in the same switch. Now, when we get to layer three, we have firewalls, state for firewalls. We have intrusion detection systems that can look for things that are going wrong. We have layer three access list. We have host-based firewalls. At layer three, we can do a lot. So the key is maximize what you can do at layer two and maximize what you can do at layer three and maximize what you're filtering at layer four and felt to maximize what you're doing at layer seven on your next generation firewalls with your intrusion detection. So different levels, different things you do, but really, really good question. Oh, I should ask you, if you're having a good time, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. Please tell others uh, we have free AWS certification materials on our channel, free um, AWS Solution Architect Associate, free AWS Advanced Networking, which is like an intro to, intro to networking. And then of course we have the free CCNA. John Clark, is 802.trunking the same as VLAN tagging? Well, the trunk enables you to put multiple VLANs on a single wire. VLAN tagging is what enables you to put multiple VLANs on a single wire and keep them logically separated. So VLAN trunking is the ability to connect two switches. Um, the tagging is what enables you to keep your traffic separate on them, but very similar. 
Good question there. Great one, actually. Chris, if you want to bring in the next one. Explain it, SD WAN. Ronald Nazo, SD WAN is a concept way, way, way outside of the CCNA thing. But let me tell you this. Typically, in normal environments, routers have a control plane, OSPF, BGP, intermediate systems to intermediate systems, label switching, tag and load switching, RSVP signaling. That's the control plane. And that resides on the routers. And we also have a forwarding plane on the routers, which is the forwarding. So with SD-WAN, what makes it special is instead of using the routers to determine the best path through the network, we separate the control plane onto something else that's smarter and more application aware. And then it can tell the routers how to forward traffic through the internet with the lowest latency possible. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Great concept. Um, I will bring in someday. Um, I know some people that have started some of the fanciest and best SD-WAN companies. Um, uh, we've been personal friends with some of the CEOs from some of the companies that have some of the best solutions so and some of the founders of these companies. So, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Um, that's what it is, but uh, way beyond the scope of this, kind of beyond the scope of the CCNP course as well. So not really related to this content by any stretch of the imagination. Um, what are some features that you can do on a database that you can't do on a cloud? You're talking databases, we're talking networking, Ronald, so that's not even close to related to this, so we've got to keep it somewhat related to actual networking. What does VLAN trunking protocol have to do with VLANs? It enables you to connect two switches and determine which VLANs you're going to pop on that wire in between them. Chris, you can go to the next one. How is a VLAN implemented in the data center, Ronald? Exactly the way we just did it right now. I've never heard of anything called VLANing. And then again, um, I've been in networking for 25 years, and I really only know the terms that are used by the world's greatest internet service providers, as well as the biggest banks, the biggest healthcare systems. I don't make up terms. I don't use acronyms. I don't make up fancy words, and I don't use bud words. So if I'm going to create a virtual LAN, I'm going to create a virtual LAN. If I'm going to create a trunk port between two switches, I'm going to use a trunk port. And people know trunking. Why? Because we're dealing with phone switches to phone switches, it's trunking. If we're dealing with switch to switches, and it's the standard industry term that's been used for about 30 to 40 years, as as the VLAN, I don't know about any kind of cool things that people make up on the job. I only know the official terminology, and I only communicate using official terminology. How do you get hosts to communicate on different VLANs? You can't. VLAN 1 is always going to be separated from VLAN 2 versus VLAN 3. The only way you can get them to communicate is with a router. And that's why organizations make VLANs, because VLANs can't talk to each other without a router, which enables you to put a router between them like a firewall and literally firewall off access control list of who can talk to whom. Massive security. That's why we do it. Good question. Frank, in normal environments, which is a better choice? Routers are multiple protocol switches. So it depends on what you're doing. If you're connecting to just three, if you're connecting to the internet, you might want to use just a switch, but just a router. Why? It's going to be cheap. Well, it may or may not be cheaper, but the point is, is if you only need four ports, you use a router. If you need 100 ports and routing, then you use a, use a layer three switch. So realistically, it pertains to the speed. So Frank, as a general rule, Routers are slow and switches are fast. And why? Most routers work on the following, except for big routers or switches. Packet comes in, it hits the CPU. The CPU says, yeah, go out this port, go out this port, go out this port. But when you hit this CPU, you're using software. What do we know about software? It's pathetically slow. What do we know about hardware? It's real fast. So you want to mine Bitcoin? You can use your CPU. And I promise you, you'll spend a dollar a day on electric and you'll earn 30 cents a day back. Not a good use of your time. You could mine it on the GPU. And guess what? You'll spend three bucks a day for your electric and you'll earn a dollar fifty back if you're lucky. Or you could buy an ASIC, an application specific internet circuit that can do the equivalent of a thousand CPUs. Will cost you two bucks a day in electric 
and generate 30 bucks a day of return on investment. Why? Because the first thing was a CPU, which is designed to do anything. The second was it has a GPU, which is optimized to do certain tests. And the third is an application-specific internet circuit that does things legendary fast. So when we get into a switch, what do we do? We send the first packet to the CPU, and we send the next packet to an ASIC or a fully programmable ASIC. So that flow is in hardware. So when you need speed, we're using layer three switches. Or we're using core internet routers that have application-specific inter integrated circuits, fully programmable ASICs, and there. So now you know. Software, slow, hardware, fast. Generally speaking, routers for connections of remote locations. Core routing, we're using layer three switches, which are high performance, et cetera, et cetera. Will I be talking about BGP in the CCNA? BGP is not covered in the CCNA. BGP is barely covered in the CCNP. And truth be told, I don't even think in the CCIE they cover BGP in anywhere close to the amount of depth. Because, well, I learned uh, BGP for the CCIE, and, but when I took it, it was a two-day test, and it was really challenging as opposed to today's easy CCIE, which is just a single-day test. But, you know, it's not covered there. Will I be talking about BGP? Yeah, um, we'll do a BGP three- or four-hour workshop on this channel, potentially as part of this boot camp to teach BGP for cloud. Yes, absolutely. But it's not part of the CCNI. But we might do it anyway. The alternative to trunking in a real environment is trunking. That's why we use trunking. That's what we use in a production environment we have for the last 30 to 40 years, and we'll continue to do so. So no, there's not an alternative, unless you choose to use a layer three link. Could you run DNS and DHCP on a domain controller? You sure could, but reality is, I don't know of any business that's truly running DNS for their organizations or DHCP on domain controllers. Now, I know lots of people are using it internally, but externally, people are buying DNS from F5 where they're using a DNS provider. Um, they're not They're not doing any. Windows servers are basically calendaring, exchange, and small businesses. VLANs and clouds, do you have virtual... You don't have virtual switches, but you've got virtual routers in the cloud and you have to run a VLAN to the cloud. So there's no way you can deal with the cloud if you don't know switching and routing. And that's where most people try and go wrong in the cloud. What is Cisco 8500 a company is worth writing off worth the experience? Look, let's face it. Any router is the same. The Cisco iOS is the identical on anything. So. But my advice is to learn. Go buy yourself the cheapest routers you can find from Cisco. It doesn't matter. Or buy the iOS and buy yourself a simulator. Nobody cares if you say, I worked on this Cisco router versus this Cisco router. It's like saying, I speak Greek in the house or I speak Greek in the house. Who cares? It's the same language. So if you know a language, great. I happen to speak Greek. I used to speak Spanish but I don't anymore because I don't use it every day and I lost 90% of it. So if I find somebody to talk to me enough Spanish, I'll be speaking Spanish again. But no, that's the key. Um, spade is a spade, ace is an ace, and there's no other way around it. Chris, if you want to have the next one. Do you think we'll ever fully adopt IPv6? You know, <laughs> I've been working in networking for 30 years and or 25 years, and to me, IPv6 is cell phones right now, but we will be on IPv6 within a decade, I'm pretty sure, for pretty much everything. We just ran out of IP addresses and we're too digitally enabled right now. Any more, Chris? So normally I don't put this up here, but uh, it's the first one we've gotten about our program, so I'll let you answer it. Let's answer it. Seven Series Beamer. When does the next cloud batch for your cloud architect program start? It starts right now. So Seven Series Beamer, let me kind of describe the way we teach people. So. Before I went into networking, I used to practice medicine. And you know what I've done for 20 plus years of my life? I've practiced martial arts. And here's the thing. I don't have a day where we start for the following reasons. I welcome everyone on day one. So my students sign up and the 500 hours of videos in my training program are all self-paced. The labs in my program, whether somebody's setting up a firewall, 
whether it's somebody setting up server virtualization, building containers, or whether one of my students is building their own cloud. And I mean it, my students build their own cloud. That's all in their own time, so it doesn't matter. Now my live classes, which we have three classes per week, which we record because not everybody can attend every class, that's different. So in our classes, we have people from all kinds of backgrounds. So as it stands right now in my class, I've got about 30 people that are ready to graduate in the next month. What do I mean graduate? I mean hired. So certification is nothing. I can get somebody certified in a weekend, but it takes us 500 hours to get somebody hired of training. So we have live classes, which we run three times per week, two hours, three times per week, starting in next month. Now we typically do two, three hour classes. And what we happen is in the class, we've got some senior people. So the senior people are designing our cloud architectures. They're building the BGP architecture. They're setting up the, the addressing plan. They're setting up the servers, the containers, the firewalls, et cetera. The senior students lead the class. Well, I mean, I'm the leader of the class, but they lead the architectural design. The medium students help out the senior students and the brand new students, they just observe. They pay attention, they listen. A couple of weeks later, those 30 senior people are hired. They're now working as cloud architects. They're all happy. The medium students take the senior students role and those junior students that have been here watching around, they take the medium roles and the new students come in and they're there and they're observing and learning. This is the same way you train physicians. It's the same way you train martial artists and that's why they're so good at what they do. So that way you've got a corroborate environment. And that way where you've got Iwa Doikia who's over there in Hungary and Abigail that's over there in North Carolina, they're working together, they're building clouds together, they're talking together, they're working on presentation together and my students work together. So that's that. The schedule is as follows, standing right now. You have Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern time, which as it turns out equals um, 2 p.m. on Tuesdays, UK time, 9 a.m. is 2 p.m. UK time. And our Friday classes, as it stands right now, are noon um, Eastern time, which is 5 p.m. UK time. We've chosen those times because they work for the US, the UK, and India for the most part, all of North America and all of South America and uh, Europe, which is where the majority of people are, is Europe, Africa, India, um, the US, the UK, and Canada. So let's get back to the content and type CCNA. If you're here, you're awake, alert, and oriented. Okay, when I see a bunch more CCNAs, I know you guys are awake, alert, and oriented. So CCNA for me, everybody. Marjan, awesome. Leo, Nikhil, Mr. Gee, Hasman, Caroline, Leo, fantastic. Eva Doike, I love the cloud in the background. Dan Aguilo, Alexandros, Kalispera. Um, CJ, Emmanuel, fantastic. I know you guys are here. I know you guys are awake. I just want to know that you can hear and see things that are going on because I want you all to have the best career. But in order to do that, I need to know you're awake. It's not always the easiest thing to do. Abu Malik, good to see you. Hope everything's already. I haven't seen you in a long time. So bear with me. We'll get back to the content. And now we're going to talk about my absolute least favorite topic in the world called spanning trees. So bear with me, everybody. This is not my big area. My area is routing and subnet design and architectural traffic engineering and things like that and IP multicast video. But we have to talk about spanning tree. So I will, will not go to my bias of ripping out layer two networks and replacing with layer three networks. We're going to talk about spanning tree right now. So we'll talk about spanning tree and rapid spanning tree. We're going to get relatively detailed in spanning tree. And then we'll talk about some spanning tree concepts. Okay. So remember when I created this document earlier, Chris, remember this is slide 174. I want to go back to this picture before we go there. We go back to this architecture that I designed with the broadcast storm because uh, I really want to walk everybody through that. That's why I redrew that picture. Okay, wow, I really draw this back a long time. Okay, so let's 
Let's go back to this picture. On this picture, I want everybody to look at it. Remember, I've got this environment. Eva Doikia wants to send a message to my beautiful cat, Cindy. They like each other. They're friends. So Eva Doikia has a picture of a beautiful tuna. So she wants to send a picture. So she's on this layer two network, not a layer three network. So she, 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 she does this ARP who has the MAC address so for this. And the question comes into switch four. It gets sent out this port. It gets sent to switch two. It gets sent to switch three. It gets sent to switch one. Switch three sends it to switch one. Switch one sends it to switch three. We got traffic circling, globing, whoa, goes around, goes around, goes around. The switches re, re, re forward it. They go back in both directions. Broadcast, broadcast, broadcast. The whole network is filled up. Our 100 gig link is filled up because of one broadcast. And that's called a broadcast storm because the network keeps routing these. Remember, there's no router. There's no time to live. So there's nothing that degrades the packets and makes them die. The frames keep going on around and around and around and around and around. You fill up your network and everything breaks down. So we have to block one of these links. And if we block one of these links, look, the problem is solved instantly. Now, Cindy sends a photo to Eva Doikia, And it's a photo and it has a question and it says, bling me salmon, please. And Eva Doikia says, sends a message back that says, Cindy, guess what? I'm going to go to Alaska. And I'm going to bring you some salmon, but will you let me rub your belly for an hour, pet your head, and play with your ears? And Cindy says, yes. So now Evo sends it. And what happens? The unknown frame goes out this port. It 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 goes out this port. And it gets to Cindy. So Cindy responds. The switch is learning that this is the best path. Now what happened? It never got sent back because this port was blocked. And that's what spanning tree will do. Spanning tree will dynamically block and unblock ports so we don't loop our data around. So the next time Cindy wants to reach out to her really good friend Evo and send her a picture of the salmon with the hope of getting the salmon back. Or the next time Evo wants to see a picture of Cindy and she sends her a message over the network, we don't have loops, our network doesn't go down. Now my cat Cindy is an expert at breaking networks. She's good at chewing ethernet cables. She's good at using her paw to power off servers. She's incredibly good at helping me type good spelling by walking on my keyboard. And she knows how to use her teeth to unplug servers. She's good at this. She unplugs switches and occasionally she gets her fur in my firewall. So she is a great network troubleshooter, but now we don't want broadcast storms. That's another problem that we don't want to add to the list of problems that we have. Broadcast storms. And let me tell you, I've seen broadcast storms a long time ago and they are real bad. And they are nothing fun to constrain or deal with and you don't want to be dealing with it. So either use layer three or, you know, now we'll go back to this. So I'm um, spanning tree, realistically speaking, is a redundancy protection. So without something like spanning tree or rapid spanning tree, as you can see, we just have broadcast storms. So what happens when you enable spanning tree or rapid spanning tree, some of the ports on certain switches will be blocked. And the whole point is that loop avoidance strategy. So what happens is it's going to prevent loops by blocking ports. So keep that in the back of your mind. Spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, prevent looping frames by adding an additional check on the interface before the switch sends the traffic. So if the port is in a forwarding state, it'll forward the traffic. If the port is in a blocking state, it's not used. So no different than if I've got two links and I rip out a link, it's not usable. Plug the link back in and it works. But this is dynamic. This happens automatically, as they like to say in this. Um, it's part of the protocol. It's part of the algorithm. So what is a broadcast storm? The forwarding of a frame repeatedly, repeatedly, consuming up the whole link or most of it. It creates MAC address instability because what happens is all these switches start forwarding it out all ports and they start getting responded in all ports. The switches don't even know where to send the data. They get confused. In routing, that's called a routing loop, but in switching, that's called MAC address table. And the fact is we've got multiple stuff being sent from all angles at all times, and it is ugly. So I'll walk you through another example. We've got this guy over here. This is Chris. Chris desires to send a message to, um, let's say, Lamin. So Chris's message goes, and it goes to this switch, which goes forward to this switch, back 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 to this switch, and it becomes real ugly, and there is your network. So we don't want that. 
So what is spanning tree going to do? It's going to block one of those links temporarily. And if another link goes away, it's going to unblock it automatically. So we're going to make sure at all times, at all times, we're up. And when we've got a problem, no big deal. We've got the self-healing capabilities of the network. So think about it this way. Interface is in the forwarding state. Forward, normally. In a blocking state, no frames are forwarded except spanning tree, which is control plane messages will be spent. Um, the, the bridge protocol data units, as they call it, going back and forth. So keep that in the back of your mind. So what does it look like? How does spanning tree block the loop? So it blocks the loop in the following manner. So bear with me a second. Let's go back into the same diagram over here. Um, bear with me. It's, it's a lot of stuff to go back and forth with these kinds of environments. So let's take this over here. So let's go to here. So now you can see we've enabled spanning tree. And what's ultimately going to occur here is Chris sends the frame to switch three. Okay, and as Chris sends the frame to switch three, switch three forwards the frame only to switch one, but not switch two. Why? Because it's in a blocking state, and therefore switch two will fly the, flum, uh, the frame out its ports at faster Ethernet zero slash twelve and gigabit Ethernet zero slash zero, and then switch three will physically re receive the frame, but it's going to ignore it from any place else. So that's what's going on. So if we were at layer three, we would have a time to live, but we're at layer two, so a time to live doesn't make sense, doesn't exist. So that's why we have to do this stuff, or else our traffic will go on forever. So how does spanning tree work? This is the ugliness of it. So spanning tree basically uses three criteria to choose whether to put an interface in forwarding or blocking. The first thing that happens is that whether we're dealing with spanning tree or rapid spanning tree, there's an election of something called a root bridge. Root, main, root, privileged access, root, king, whatever you want to call it. So spanning tree will enable and elect a root switch. Now, spanning tree will put all interfaces on the root switch into a forwarding state. Spanning tree will put all things on that state into a forwarding state. Now, each non-root switch will consider one of its ports to have the least administrative course between itself and the root port. The least administrative cart, port cost. That cost is considered the switch port's root cost. So I'm going to say this again. Each non-root switch considers one of its ports to have the least administrative cost between itself and the root switch. That cost is called the switch root's cost. Now, spanning tree or rapid spanning tree will place the port that is part of the least root course, root, least root cost path, and that will be placed in forwarding. So, root bridge, root switch, everything forwards. All non-root switches will look at the, the, the port that has the lowest administrative cost to the root switch. That's called the switch's root cost. Now, spanning tree or rapid spanning tree will place that part with the lowest car path cars cost, and that will call it the root part, and that will always be in forwarding state. Now you can have many switches that are going to attach to the same Ethernet segment, but due to the fact that the links connect two devices, a link that would have at most two switches. So with two switches on the link, the switch with the lowest root cost compared to the other switches in the same class is placed in forwarding. So we're picking the most optimal ports to the root switch. They're placed in forwarding. So the switch is that becomes the designated switch, and the switch's interface attached to that segment is called the designated port. So, well, I'm not Mr. Spanning Tree. It's pretty simple. You got your root bridge. You got your ports on the way to the root bridge that are the lowest ports to that root bridge or root switch. Guess what? Those are called root ports and placed in forwarding. Mm. We also have the concept of a designated port. And uh, now you know the switch is the designated switch, and that switch is interface attached to the segment. It's called the designated port. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. So 
in spanning tree, what's going to make a port forward or block? If it's the root switch, every port forwards. If it's the non-root switch's root port, the one that's closest to the root switch, everybody forwards. If we're dealing with a LAN port or user access port, guess what? The designated ports, which are forwarding the things, are also forwarding. So any other port that is not a designated port uh, a root port or attached to this designated root switch will be blocking. And that's how it's going to work. So thinking about that, let's talk about this whole election. Here's how it works. So we have this the spanning tree, rapid spanning tree bridge ID. Now this is an eight byte unique value to each switch. The bridge ID consist of a two byte priority field and a six byte system identifier. That's part of the eight bytes. With the system ID being a universal address or the hard coded MAC address into the switch. So using a burned in MAC address ensures that the switch identifiers will be unique. Why? Every MAC address in the world is unique. So they have the standard OEY or the first part of the MAC address and the second half. And that's the unique part. So doing it, it's always going to be unique. So when spanning trees has these messages that sends between things, they're called bridge protocol data units. I didn't make up the term bridge protocol data units, BPDUs. And they're also called configuration BPDUs. And this is where the switches exchange information with each other. Now, the most common bridge protocol data unit is the hello, which basically says, hey, I'm here, and tells you things about the switch's identifiers like its bridge ID. And by using its own bridge ID or listing its own bridge ID, switches can tell who sent the, hello, I'm here. Hello, I'm here. Hello, I'm here. So let's talk about some key information that's in the bridge protocol data unit. Well, it tells you the root bridge. It says this is the leader. Then what else does it tell? Um, it sends the sender's bridge ID. Hey, I sent the hello. What's my ID? My name's Mike. Mike, I'm introducing myself to you. That's the center's bridge ID. Now, what is the root cost? The spanning tree root cost is the cost that it takes via metric to get to that root switch. And then, of course, there's timers. You can play with these timers. Play with these timers at your own risk. Um, hello timers, max age timers, forwarding timers. Again, play with them at your own risk. Why do people take do timers? Because spanning tree is pathetically slow. And people didn't want to wait 30, 40, 50 seconds, so they started tuning timers. And when you tune timers, you break things. So try not to tune tire timers unless you have that choice. So keep that in the back of your mind. So how does this root switch election occur? Well, I, I, there's a logic, but it's kind of ugly. So the re-switch occurs by the device that has the lowest numeric IP ID. So the lowest MAC address. So, but it's really the lowest numeric value for bridge ID. So, because the bridge ID starts with a priority, essentially the key is uh, set the priority. So, determine your architecture and plan your root bridge. So, give it the lowest priority, and then it's the root bridge. Now, if you didn't set the priority, it's the lowest MAC address. So, you have two switches. With two with equal priorities, whichever one has the lowest MAC address wins the election. Again, I didn't make up this protocol, but it's there. So, realistically speaking, so how's this election process work? The process begins with all switches claiming to be the root to sound out hello messages, hello, 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 hello. And then what happens is if a switch hears a hello message that's better, the switch will say, wait. New president, new root switch, we all migrate over. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. The hellos that we're talking about, these bridge identifiers, they're going to identify themselves. So when the hello is sent by something that's better, it becomes the new root. So effectively what happens is everybody agrees with the switch that has the lowest bridge ID and everybody supports it. So do not leave this up to chance. Do not leave this up to chance. If you do, you're going to find out that some little mini switch and a wiring closet is the leader. You don't want this. You want your big, powerful, robust, multiple control modules, multiple power supplies, and multiple circuits being your root bridge. 
You want to know it's your most powerful switch. So manually do this. How do you manually do it? Lowest priority, and you're good to go. This is one of those things that you tune them. So let's talk about the election process. Let's walk through an election process example. I'll walk you through one. Bear with me one second. Oh, let's now take this. So now what's really, really occurring. Let me share this with you so you can see it. Now what's really, really coming up. So Switch One has advertised itself as the root, as have Switch 2 and Switch 3. So that's kind of what's realistically going off. So realistically speaking, um, Switch 2 believes it's better than Switch 1. So Switch 2 now starts forwarding. At this point, what you see is Switch 1 is saying, hello, I'm root. And Switch 2 agrees that Switch 1, hello, is better. And then it says, Switch 1 is root. Now, Switch 3 is still claiming to be root but it begins sending its own. And wait, switch three has a lower bridge identifier, so guess what? Now switch three becomes root. So that's the key. Manually, manually pick your switch. Make the one that you want to be root and set the root priority, or set the, uh, the, 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 the priority of that to the lowest number. The low, and, and then you're gonna be, um, guess what? That becomes the root bridge. So manually do this kind of stuff. Give you another example. In this particular situation, switch one has a lower bridge ID than switch three. So switch one um, wins. But generally speaking, I don't like to leave things up to chance. I like to be careful with what I do. So now let's talk about it. So we know the um, lowest bridge ID, lowest priority. That's what we're setting. But what about the ports on these switches? So. The second part of the spanning tree, rapid spanning tree election process is when each not root, each non root switch has to choose its root port, which is the port that is closest, closest, closest to the situation, to the root bridge. So, which interface has the lowest cost via spanning tree to the root bridge? That's your root port. So, how do we calculate it? What switches do is they take their interfaces, the local ones, and add that to the root cost listed in every hello message they've seen. So they get these bridge protocol data units, which send information, their MAC address, for example, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these are kind of those things that are coming in. So, you know, each interface is gonna, when it's gonna send it, and then the interfaces know their cost, so they're just gonna add their cost. So what happens is the spanning tree, rapid spinning tree cost is a numeric value assigned to each interface per VLAN. And the switches will look for each neighbor's root cost as the hello. So ugly way to say this. You take your primary bridge. The ports closest to the primary bridge are the root ports. Get rid of all that complexity. But, you know, that's the way they describe it. So, you know, kind of configure it for this. So if we were here, for example, um, all that we need to talk about is as follows. We've got... Uh, this port advertising its cost. We know this link's cost, and we know this link's cost. So which is the most expensive to the root? Well, this link is five, this link is four. So block this port. Four, four, well, so, you know, figure actually, you know, in this case, um, what would the cost be? You would probably block, block this, um, because this total cost is eight versus this total cost is five. But as a rule, if everything was equal, Block the one with the lowest cost. So now you kind of have an idea for the way these elections are actually occurring. So now let's talk about the designated port. Um, so for the designated port, um, and again, I'm really sorry, this spanning tree is the ugliest content in the entire CCNA curriculum. And quite frankly, I actually think the spanning tree is the ugliest content in the Cisco Certified Internet Export Curriculum too. So the last step is spanning tree or rapid spanning tree, choosing the designated port. Now remember, on the designated port on each LAN segment is a switch port that advertises the lowest cost to low. So the switch with the lowest cost to reach the root bridge 
among all the switches becomes the designated port on that section. And if the advertising toss tie, guess what? You pick the pass with the lowest bridge ID. Again, lowest MAC address. So all designated ports are forwarding. So keep that in your mind. So all root ports are forwarding. All designated ports are forwarding. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So how do we influence spanning tree? Well, remember, spanning tree rapid spanning tree works on all Cisco devices by default. But spanning tree and rapid spanning tree will work on uh, extreme network switches. They will work on Juniper switches. They'll work on any switches because guess what? There's a standards-based protocol. So they're all going to work this way. By default, switches have a default bridge ID based upon a default priority value. Um, so set the priority, lowest one. It's root switch. Now, switch interfaces basically come, um, realistically speaking, they, the cost is based upon the speed of the interface. So 100 gigabit is faster than 10 gigabit, which is faster than 1 gigabit, which is faster than 100 megabit, which is faster than 10. Now, all these routers have a reference bandwidth, and you may need to change them because they were designed not really to start looking at gigabit and 10 gigabit and 100 gigabit because, you know, these protocols were invented way before then. So we have to do some tuning periodically um, with our routing and switching protocols. But with regards to this, just keep that in the back of your mind. So it's very common um, that you're going to have a network engineer that's going to want to change spanning tree, rapid spanning tree settings, and you're going to do that. So it's really about, you know, determining who your root bridge is, changing bridge identifiers, so you can basically change the port cost to favor this link versus another link because you don't want this stuff working on itself out for you because, again, it'll pick some bridge in a wiring closet and you're going to be sending all of your corporation's data through the wrong switch and everything will fall apart. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So what are the default costs as it stands right now? 10 megabit, the default cost uh, used to be 100. Now the cost after 2004 is, 200, is 2 million because it's so slow. 100 megabit link right now has got a cost of 19. It used to have a cost of 19 when I started networking. And uh, now it's got a cost of 200,000. A gigabit link used to have a cost of four. Now it's got a cost of 20,000 because it's considered slow in today's world. A 10 gigabit link used to have a cost of two, but now it's got a cost of 2,000. In the old days, we had nothing for 100 gigabit links, but now the cost for that is 200. And for a ter terabyte per second links, the cost is 20. So we have to adapt all this rapid stuff coming out there. So let's talk about spanning tree when the network is stable. So root bridge has been elected, root parts are into forwarding, designated ports are forwarding, and everything else is out there and blocking, and life's good. So it's stable. So every two seconds, I'm here, I'm the root bridge. And then every two seconds, the non-root bridges forward those out of all designated ports. So all the devices get to see, hey, I'm here, I'm the root bridge, I'm alive, I'm awake, I'm alert, I'm oriented, kind of like a help check. Like me asking you to type hashtag CCNA so that I knew that you were there at the time. It's a health check, I knew you were awake. Say I'm a routing and switching guy. I do health checks for everything. Health checks with load balancers, health checks with DNS. I just do health checks everywhere, I'm a routing guy. We routing people do health checks for everything. So that's where we create self-healing, high availability, high performance networks. So each non-root switch will forward the lows. Now each switch will set the root cost based upon the calculated cost, but you can also see the calculated cost to the source. Now, assuming that the whole timer is default, the whole timer is the same, and we didn't tune it, and I don't recommend you tune it, each switch will send those messages every two seconds. And if a switch stops saying hellos, hello, are you there? Hello, are you there? Hello, are you there? Or it gets a hello and stops hearing it and doesn't get the hellos. It knows something's wrong. Or what if a switch receives different details in these hellos? Something that shows stuff that it's different. Guess what? We got a problem, a big problem. So again, when the switches stop hearing hellos, they know recalculate, 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 kind of like your GPS when you hit it, when you hit a detour, it recalculates it. And that's what spanning tree is doing. And again, I'm really sorry. The spanning tree is the hardest, most complicated, most ugly stuff of the whole content. So bear with me. So when we're dealing with spanning tree, we've got a hello timer that's two seconds. A max age is 10 seconds. So 
How long do you wait after not hearing, hello, 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 before you say, okay, it's not there. So um, 10 seconds. And now think about it. If it takes 10 seconds to detect it, and then it takes about 15 more seconds for the port to transition into forwarding, you're dealing with a long time. So you can be a minimum is 25 seconds with layer two till you detect a change. Now, my customers, I put an LSPF or an intermediate systems, intermediate systems network. We turn on some RSVP signaling. We then turn on tag switching or label switching, create primary and explicit paths across the network. Now I got a cable cut. I can do it in 40 milliseconds, which means you won't even know that my network is dead. So that's why people like me are heavy, hardcore routing engineers. Don't deal with any of this layer two stuff. We've replaced it with stuff that works so much better and faster. But in the enterprise and the smaller companies, you're going to be using spanning tree. And when you're going to connect to the cloud, you do have to send them a VLAN. So you're going to at least want to run that on this port just in case. I actually probably don't need to be, but if you've got multiple ones, they're still going to be on different subnets, so you don't need it. But just understand, bridging, 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 spanning tree. So let's talk a little bit about timers and healing. If a switch doesn't get its hello within the whole time, it realizes there's a problem. So with the default settings, what happens is the max age is 20 seconds. 10 times the default hello sections is two. So realistically speaking, based on your settings, it can be 10 seconds or 20 seconds. And now, poof, you stop here on the hellos, 10 seconds or 20 seconds later, it expires. And now the switches are gonna recalculate and restrend their data. So it's not gonna be the fastest thing in the world. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So let's talk about the last thing on spanning tree, and then we'll take a little break and we'll talk a little about rapid spanning tree, which is a huge improvement over spanning tree, but it's not great. So spanning tree uses this concept of a role and a state. And a role relates to how spanning tree is gonna analyze the topology and a state's going to tell it which switch, which switch is going to send or receive frames. Now, when spanning tree converges, and what is convergence? When everybody figures out the way that the traffic should go, the switch will choose their new port roles, and the switches will determine whether to block or forward. So kind of keep that in mind. I talked about in the beginning. That's that election we're talking about, and switches can just move. Um, and realistically speaking, by, you, by tuning spanning tree, to creating something called sp rapid spanning tree, which we'll talk about later, switches can move faster from, from a blocking to a forwarding state, et cetera. But switches come out forwarding, they announce themselves as a root bridge, then they receive a bridge protocol data unit, which has an election. The switches determine which paths have the lowest cards to the root bridge. That's the root port, forwarding. They elect their designated ports, forwarding, and they block all other ports. So that's why. So now when we're talking about spanning tree, there's a couple of states on the port. Let's talk about what those ports are. So right now you got a port that's blocked. And in the blocking state, what happens? Nothing. Now all of a sudden, the port's going to transition. And the port goes into a learning state where it's just learning which frames, which MAC addresses are there. The switch will get rid of the old MAC address table and it's still gonna to start to create new entries by the MAC address as it comes. Then after listening, it's gonna learn. Switches here, it's here and stuff. It's beginning, it's learning MAC addresses. It's learning all the topology in the network. It's learning. Then at some point, it's gonna to have to transition to forwarding. And that's realistically, so listening, learning, those kind of things. Keep that in the back of your mind. So what are the states and spanning tree. Blocking, not sending. Obvious. Listening, hey, what's going on? Learning, let me get smart. Forward, I start forwarding, I unblock that thing. So from the blocking to the listening to the learning to the forwarding, 25, 45 seconds, that's about how long it takes. That is for spanning tree. And that's the way spanning tree works. So I've got a couple of slides on spanning tree. And after we get to spanning tree, uh, through spanning tree, I will take some questions because I just, uh, spanning tree is a little ugly. So let's talk about spanning tree. So 
I just told you about spending trade. I also told you I don't use it. I told you I hate it. And here's why I hate it. Not only is this brood bridge complex kind of pain in the whatever, but it takes forever to converge. And I was like, hey, wait, I can just turn on this MPLS network and converge in less than 40 milliseconds. Or I can wait 45 seconds for this horrible spanning tree to work. So what did the switching people say? Well, switching is dying and we don't want switching dying. So because otherwise we're going to have a whole bunch of Mike Gibbs running around ripping out our switches and replacing them with routers, which I've done and still continue to do. And it works great. So the switching people said, hey, not everybody can learn routing. Routing's kind of complex. We're going to create a new spanning tree, and we're going to call it rapid spanning tree, and it's going to fix all the problems of the old spanning tree. So they run the same elections. Spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, elect the same roots bitch with the same rules and tiebreakers. Spanning tree and rapid spanning tree elect their ports, their root ports, the same way. Spanning tree and rapid spanning tree elect their designated ports the same way. Spanning tree and rapid spanning tree each report their forts in a forwarding state. But normal spanning tree, 25, 35, 45, 50 seconds or more every time a cable cuts to get your traffic. That is not acceptable. So spanning tree enables the convergence or the self-healing to occur rapidly. That's why it's rapid spanning tree. So rapid spanning tree changes and adds the way spanning tree avoids loops by and enables you to transition quicker from forwarding to this, from blocking to forwarding. That's the difference, the speed that you go from blocking to forwarding. And rapid spanning tree can go from forwarding to blocking fast, or from blocking to forwarding fast. So how? Rapid spanning tree defines more cases in which you can avoid waiting for the timer. So rapid spanning tree adds a mechanism by which a switch can replace its root port without waiting for the forwarding in certain situations. Rapid spanning tree adds a new mechanism to replace the designated port without waiting for it to reach forwarding in some instances. And rapid spanning tree lowers the waiting times, in which case RSB, rapid spanning tree must wait for a timer to time out. You know, like that hello, every two seconds where you could wait up to 10 misses to, in order to do anything. So rapid spanning tree uses the term alternate port to refer to a switch ports that could be used as a root port if the root port ever fails. If you've got potential, it uses the term alternate port and it keeps it stored. Now the backup port can provide backup is to the other switch. Now this, realistically speaking, so, you know, realistically speaking, it's a backup port. Now backup ports were all really designed to have hubs. So they're unlikely to be used today because there's no hubs anymore. But spanning tree and rapid spanning tree you know, are similar in a lot of ways, but rapid spanning tree differs in a few ways. With spanning tree, the root switch creates a hello. With rapid spanning tree, each switch generates its own independent hellos. And with rapid spanning tree allows for queries between neighbors rather than waiting for hold time. So are you there? Are you there? What's going on? What's going on? They're all talking to each other. You got a family that communicates. You can detect a problem faster with communication than without communication. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So these types of protocol changes help spanning rapid spanning tree isolate what happened in the network fast as opposed to waiting for all these timers to expiration. So what are the port roles in, in rapid spanning tree? Well, we've got the big port that begins the non-root switch, which is called the root port. We've got the port that replaces the root port called an alternate port. We've got the switch port designated to forward, which is called the designated port. We have a port that replaces the designated port called the backup port in case the designated port fails. And we've got a port that's been administered disabled called this disabled port. So the point is, is you've got more stuff, more backups, and the ability to detect um, things that are there. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So um, to be an alternate port, both the root port and the alternate port must receive hellos from the same root switch. So two hellos, two links. An alternate port is basically the second best option for a root port because it's fast, it's going to come over, and the alternate port can take over from the root port, which changes very, very rapidly. So let's walk through an example of this. Um, in this particular environment, we've got a root switch and we've got a blocked port. But we can unblock this port really, really, really fast after a failure. That's why it's spanning tree versus rapid spanning tree.
So now look at this over here. So now we've got a link failure over here. This link failure is detected. And instead of listening and learning, I'm in the wrong one, apologies. So we've got, a, in this particular case, we've got a link that fails over here. Now, if it was spanning tree, we'd wait for 10 seconds of hellos, or 20 seconds. Hello, missed. Hello, missed. Hello, missed. Hello, missed. Hello, missed. And that would go on. That's 20 seconds. Now this port over here would go into the listening mode for about 10 seconds, the learning mode, et cetera. By the time this would normally fail, that would be 50 seconds. But now we're using rapid spanning tree. So we've got all this alternate port um, figured out ahead of time. This link fails. Poof, this instantly transitions to forwarding. So now we don't have to wait 50 seconds, it's fast. So for the heavy duty routing people like me that say, hey, this switching thing is terrible, the IEEE came up with this, the Internet Engineer Task Force out of there. Um, so the, IEEE, the Institute for Electrical Engineers that does Ethernet versus the Internet Engineering Task Force, which does uh, our, our, our RFCs, et cetera, that we run forth in our specifications for IP stuff. That's what went on, and that's why they fixed it, to go straight from transitioning into forwarding. So let's talk about the RSPP, the rapid spanning tree spades. Both spanning tree and rapid spanning tree use port states, both similar, but they're similar, but with differences. Rapid spanning tree keeps the learning and forward states, so it goes straight to, forward, to forwarding. Rapid spanning tree renames the blocking state to a discarding state, and it redefines it slightly. So rapid spanning tree uses discarding as opposed to blocking the link. So there's a difference between disabled and blocking. It's just discarding frames. Blocking should be somewhat obvious by now. But the interface can work, but spanning tree chooses not to forward the traffic. Spanning tree disabled means that the interface was administratively disabled, meaning you shut it down. So rapid spanning tree just combines that into a discarding state. Let's talk about the port state. So if the port is administratively down in spanning tree, it's disabled. And if it's if the port is administratively disabled in spanning tree, it's disabled. In rapid spanning tree, it's discarding. Um, if we've got something that's stable in spanning tree, it's blocking while it's dis discarding in rapid spanning tree. Now, with spanning tree, we go listening, and we go straight to, uh, to learning and then forwarding. But with rapid spanning tree, we, we can technically go straight um, to forwarding from blocking. So um, what happens is we go straight into learning, learning, and forwarding into forwarding. So we don't have to go through as many states. And we're not reliant on waiting for the hello and the hold timers to wear out. And that's why we can go so much, much longer. So... Rapid spanning tree and the backup designated port role. The rapid spanning tree does backup port role acts as yet another rapid spanning tree port role compared to spanning tree. The rapid spanning tree backup role creates a new way for rapid spanning tree to replace the designated ports on certain port on certain lands. The need for a backup port can be a bit confusing at first, but the backup port role only is, is it only happens in designs that are very recent, and and that's how these kind of things sort of work. So that's what we're talking about: spanning tree versus rant, spanning tree, loop avoidance strategies to make sure you can have multiple links. Now I'm not going to really spend a lot of time configuring rapid spanning tree with you guys or spanning tree with you guys because I want to get you guys into the heavy stuff that really matters. I want to get you guys into some routing, um, some subnetting. So tomorrow we're going to get into internet protocol. We're going to have some fun. But, you know, some people may have some questions. I want to make sure everybody had a good experience on their CCNA course. I know this is a free CCNA course, but I want to run this as if it was a $5,000 boot camp. Questions, lectures, labs. Ask us the questions so we can help you get network hard or cloud hard. So, um, got some questions, please ask them. Why do you need spanning tree if you have TTL? Well, Kai Geiso, we don't have a TTL at layer two. We have a TTL at layer three. So spanning tree is for layer three, layer two. And we have routing protocols at layer three. And routers degrade TTL, but we don't have that in layer two.
so we, we, we can't use it. But good question. Chris, if you want to bring in the next one. Um, thank you so much, 7 Series Beamer. I work really hard to make sure that everybody has the best opportunity to get their first cloud architect job, network architect job. I got to tell you, I had such a good tech career. I was able to retire at 34 years old and then just do, and I loved it. And I want every one of you guys to have the absolute best career. And whether it's a networking cloud, as a cloud architect, solution architect, Merck architect, enterprise architect, I want you to have a ball. It's my mission in life right now to train the next generation of the world's best network architects and cloud architects. And after that, I'm going to go to Jamaica and I'm going to practice the Stanga Yoga, listen to Ziggy Marley singing about beach in Hawaii, which is a song written about our Stanga Yoga. That's where I'm going to be. So we're that. So I haven't asked anybody to do so. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. If you're paying attention and you're having a good time, please like, leave a comment. It helps us with the algorithms and the rankings. And we really like to share our message of free training to help as many people as possible. Thank you so much, Marjan. I was thrilled to have you here, and it was wonderful. Yay, Internet Protocols. I'm with you there, Eva Dyke. Internet Protocols are my favorite. Alonzo, my good friend. Um, I am so happy to see you. Awesome session. Thank you. Loving the GCA community. Thank you. Alonzo, I know I haven't spoken to you for a day, and it's been a long time, but I hope you're doing wonderfully. And I hope you're having a great time. Zhao, so wonderful to see you here. CCNA, Alonzo. Yes, absolutely. It was a great session, CCNA. Thank you. I want to try hard for you. Leo, uh, CCNA, fantastic. Alonzo, cloud hired. I love it. Tom Arthias, um, thank you so much. If you understand me a bit. Parakalo, I know you're in the Netherlands, but I'm not loving that name of yours. So just in case. Um, uh, okay, so um, um, you're welcome, FM Linux uh, CCNA. So fantastic. Twinkle, so wonderful seeing you here. Ruben, so wonderful seeing you here. CJ, and determining the cost of a spanning true routes. You mentioned the weighted values for speed versus 10 versus 100, et cetera. Is there a table that's easiest to get that information? Yes. You go to the Cisco website and they, you look spanning tree link cost and it will tell you. Why do I want to send you to the Cisco website and not give it to you? Because it changes constantly. And I will give you the best advice that I can give you from 25 years tech experience. Reading five minutes of documentation can save you 500 hours of troubleshooting. So every single time, I always go to the manufacturer source and look at things even after 25 years, if it's a production environment, because I want to make sure that nothing changes. Great question there. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Crying. You never love pets, however, and every night you dream of Cindy and Sonny the Crat. All the credit goes to Mike and Steve. Thank you. You know, here's the funny thing. I never wanted a cat at all. My wife loved cats. So what did I do? I went to the cat rescue to make my wife happy and get her a cat. While I was there, little baby girl, literally speaking, puts her paw on the glass. I walk in. She rubs against me. I sit down. She sits on my lap. 45 minutes later, with that cat looking at me like this, that cat came home. I got the cat for my wife. The cat sleeps either in between my knees, on my chest, or right above my head every night. And she's like, yeah, the greatest thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> Who knew? Eva Doike is so wonderful to see you here. I rescued the cat for my wife, and I think the cat rescued me. Um, I try, so Seven Sears Beamer, I used to practice medicine before I went into technology. And the thing for me was I had to learn how to teach patients to take care of their health. For example, if I had a patient that had congestive heart failure because their left ventricle was too thick, I couldn't say to my patients, your left ventricle is this many millimeters too thick, which causes the ejection, which causes the preload of your heart via Frank Starling's law to be low, which causes your ejection fraction to be reduced. But what I could say is because your heart muscle is enlarged, what's occurred is your heart can't pump efficiently. So I'm going to give you this medication to increase the pumping ability of your blood. And the patient says, okay, Michael, take it. So I, I did a couple of things. I practiced medicine first, and that really taught me how to simplify concepts. But to be fair, I did and Cisco together, we probably spent about a quarter of a million dollars on my communication skills, soft skills, 
and emotional intelligence training. And a lot of that was taught how I could translate technology concepts that were really challenging from really smart engineers to the executives that would be the buying decisions. So engineers, all tech, architects have business, half tech. That's why I'm an architect. That's why when people that want to become engineers become architects, if they don't study the communication skills, the leadership skills, the emotional intelligence, the ROI modeling, the CXO relevancy skills, that's why they can't get there because it's that special training. So um, that's the difference between uh, this and I've had to have special training to become an architect. And for the students in my Cloud Architect Career Development Program, I teach them all how to do this because it's required for the job and even the interviews. Chris, if you want to bring in the next one, I love questions that are like that. They're really solid. Do you need to know networking before the cloud? Well, if you don't know the network, you don't know the cloud. So I have a lot of students that come with me and I teach them the data center and the network, which is the cloud. And then I teach them the cloud and they're like, oh my God, Mike, I could have learned the cloud in 48 hours. And you do. If you don't know the network and you don't know the cloud, um, then it's incredibly challenging. But if you know the network, you know the cloud. And I got to tell you, it's not hard. So when I was practicing internal medicine, I woke up one day and said, I want to learn networking. And within six months, I was the lead architect at the world's largest internet service provider at the time, which was WorldCom. And I was in the team that did the most sophisticated designs in all of networking. A year later, I was the lead architect designing systems for the world's busiest market maker on, net, on Wall Street. So if you know the network, if you know the router, if you know the switch, if you know BGP, if you know your IGPs, everything on the cloud is going to be silly easy. And then if you know the data center, what is virtualization? What are containers? What are firewalls? What are load balancers? How does block storage, object storage, file storage work? Guess what, Anthony? If you're on Azure, Google, Oracle, Dell, Palo Alto, Cisco Cloud, it's irrelevant to you. So that's all you need to do. You'll be good to go. So yes, do both at the same time. Would I recommend a switch to practice learning VLANs? Um, it depends. Are you an architect or are you going to be an engineer? If you're going to be an architect, you need to know all about how VLANs work, and I would be focused on being an expert. If you want to be an administrator or an engineer, um, realistically putting uh, with those kind of things, then you're definitely going to need to practice. So should you buy a switch? You could buy a switch. Um, you could, uh, that's probably the easiest thing to do. Most of these servers are going to cost you more to set up than the switch. So they have CCNA racks on eBay that you can buy. And, uh, I find something cheap, basically one switch, two routers, and you're good to go. Um, and you can typically do that for about a hundred or $150, but you can probably get away with enough and without it. So it depends on what is your goal. If your goal is to be a network engineer, yes. If your goal is to be a network administrator, yes. If your goal is to be a cloud architect, it's more about how the BGP works and how to design it than necessarily how to configure it. So for that, it would be helpful, but you could probably get away with simulators, et cetera. So it depends on your goal career. But definitely speaking, if you want to work in networking, I would definitely get some hands-on experience. Any tips for a mind that's racing? Yes. Uh, can I, can I, can I butt in here, Mike? Yes. You're probably not the best person to ask that question to. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so as Chris said, asking me who at 1130 at night sends my chief operating officer, Hey, I had this idea. I don't expect you to do it now, but I don't want to forget it. Hey, by the way. So, but, but what I will tell you is this. I actually practice Ashtanga yoga every single day. And Chris can tell which days I haven't practiced yoga because I'm calling him at 10 o'clock at night. Hey, Chris, I had an idea. Hey, Chris, I had this idea. And on days where I actually practice yoga or meditate, Chris, I thought about this. And Chris, you know what? This thing that you've been suggesting, I'm going to do it tomorrow. Chris, I had a chance to think about this. And guess what? Tomorrow I'm going to do this. So, yes, I recommend learning how to control our thoughts. Um, either through cognitive behavior therapy, which I use on a daily basis, or via, um, realistically speaking, um, using uh, breathing meditations, which I have for the students in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. We have a cognitive behavior therapy section, and we also have about six or seven different meditations plus yoga that we use. Why? Because when you're stressed, you can't give a good presentation. 
And what is emotional intelligence? It's the ability to control your emotions and manage somebody else's emotions. So, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Yeah, so I was an internal medicine nurse practitioner and I switched to IT and I had my own internal medicine office, etc. I say, yes, I did. I came from a medical background. I just love tech more. Okay, so for me, I like you to learn the cloud. So I want to make this clear. Certifications do not get anybody hired for any job anywhere, anytime. Now, certifications can make up for a lack of experience on a resume and a certification can get to an interview. So here's what I like to tell my students. Don't get a million certifications. In fact, if you get 30 certifications, the world's gonna see you as an architect and as an engineer and never an architect. So I have friends that have gone and gotten 10 certifications and said, Mike, I wanna be an architect. And I say, let's remove seven of those certifications from your resume because nobody's gonna take you seriously. And what happens? They don't believe me. They spend a year trying to apply for jobs with 10 certifications. I say, are you ready? I get rid of the certifications. I start talking about the digital transformation they did. I get rid of all the coding and all the acronyms and all the techies business, send them on their first interview and they get paid and they get $100,000 more than their last job. So what gets you hired? Knowledge. So there's two ways you can do this. You could do it the way the cloud providers would suggest, which I think is the worst way to learn. Let's say I get into a car. If I teach you this is a steering wheel and I teach you this pedal is the accelerator and this pedal is the brake and this is the ignition button, you know what it is. Now, what did the cloud providers do? They took the same 40-year-old networking services and they renamed them. So pretend you're at AWS and you have this elastic rotational directional changer and you go to Google and Google has this cloud rotational interdirectional optimizer. And then you would go to Azure and Azure has something that's called the Express Rotational Turner Arounder thing. You'd be lost. Now, instead, if you learn what virtualization is and you know what a virtual machine is and you built it in VMware ESXi or KVM or QEMU, now you know a virtual machine on the Dell cloud is identical to the virtual machine on the Azure cloud, which is identical to the virtual machine on the Oracle cloud, which is identical to the virtual machine on the Google cloud. And by getting rid of these stupid names that the manufacturers make to make their 40 year old technology sound cool, you're learning to drive. So learn what a virtual machine is. What is object storage? Learn object storage, what it works, how it works. Be good at it, understand the metadata, how it works. And then, it doesn't matter if you whether it's Microsoft Blob, Amazon Simple Storage Solution, who thinks of these names? Google Cloud Storage is the same technology. So I recommend you get one certification, Azure or AWS, one certification. Become a master of the cloud, become a master of the network, become a master of the data center. Build your emotional intelligence, your leadership skills, your communication skills, your presentation skills, your ROI modeling, your business acumen. Then you're getting cloud hired. Now. Let's talk about this. Statistically speaking, once you go above a certain number of certifications, they don't raise your salary. But let's look at it if it is. Let's say you only had one certification and you wanted two. Potentially by getting a second certification, it can raise your salary upwards of maximum $10,000. So you've got a salary, average cloud architect earns $160,000 a year, good one earns double or triple that easily. But let's say you're an average cloud architect at $160,000 a year. You get yourself 40 more certifications and now your salary goes from 160 to 170. Or you go out there and you get some soft skills training, which on average raises your salary 30%, which is $60,000 a year for that average salary 160. Now you get yourself some emotional intelligence training. Poof, on average that raises your salary $29.6,000 per year. So now we've raised your salary $90,000 by not wasting on an extra certification that's worthless. And you do that for 30 years, that's $2.7 million. Now. Those other two skills that we told you to focus on, your soft skills and your emotional intelligence, now enable you to become a director, a VP, the chief technology officer, or anything you want. And what does that extra certification do? It locks you behind the desk. This is the techie. So figure out what you want to be. If you want to be an engineer, and engineers are great, yeah, get lots of certifications because it really matters the name of the service and how to configure it because that's all you're going to do. But if you have any desire for architecture or leadership positions, if you actually go to a customer and you start talking about EBS and S3, 
they'll laugh you out of the room. They're going to say, are you an advertisement for Amazon? Where if you said, okay, I can deal with your three petabytes of object storage, but moving it over to object storage on the cloud. And if I can deal with your 1,500 virtual machines, I'll replace them with similar virtual machines on the cloud. And I can then give you an environment that says, we need security. Of course, we can't use the cloud native things. What are we going to do? We're going to get two firewalls from Cisco and load balance them with a network load balancer. That's architecture and that's the design. So build the skills and go get hired. And certifications don't get anybody a job. Never. Nobody hires you for any certification other than maybe the CCIE because they have to prove that you're competent. Competency gets you hired. Good attitude gets you hired. Emotional intelligence gets you hired. Leadership skills get you hired. A good attitude. Happiness, good communication skills. That's what gets you hired. That's your focus. That, that can raise your salary $100,000, dollars $300,000 a year easily where a certification can. So that's my recommendation. That's how I've been coaching my people. And I got to tell you, I've got graduates that are earning $300,000 a year. It's not average, but it happens lots of times. Why? Because we focus on high value skills, not low value skills. Um, stamina. Um, Here's the reason I have stamina. I actually was trained by a bunch of Navy SEALs for mental toughness. I was actually a competitive martial artist and I've been uh, practicing martial arts forever. So hard physical training. Um, I subscribed to something that was called SEALFIT many years ago and SEALFIT was run by Navy SEALs to get guys and girls, well, guys through buds because they didn't have any women at the time. Um, and it was mental toughness training. So there's that. Uh, my multitasking skills, I wish I could say they were good. They are not. My ability to go for a week straight without sleep, uh, that's pretty solid. Um, and that came from medical training, hard work. And when I did my CCIE, I read 1,000 pages a day every day for six months. It was 75,000 pages of reading that I had to do to pass that CCI exam. And I did it in about six months because I was really motivated. So thank you so much. I, I, I do work pretty hard. And I tend to be a fireball with energy. You know, it's really funny. When I went into tech, I thought tech was the least stressful environment in the world. In fact, I know other network engineers and they're like, this is stressful. I'm like, stressful? I remember my first job. I was, everybody was stressed. They're like, the network is down. And they're like, I'm like, hold on. Click, 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 click. Okay, fixed. And they were like, Mike. And there were like 30 people and they were all you know, stressed out over it. And I was like, can't be stressed. See, here's why. See, right now we're talking. And we're using the prefrontal cortex of our brain. That's the thinking, logical, reasoning part of our brain. When we're here, we can make magic happen. But you know what happens when we get stressed? The prefrontal cortex shuts off and the amygdala kicks in. And the amygdala is this crocodile part of our brain and it's nasty. And the amygdala is great if we got to fight somebody. Yeah, well, good, because freeze, fight, or flight. But the amygdala makes us dumb. So if you don't know, if you've ever had an argument with someone and said something horrible, that you regret, that's because your prefrontal cortex shut down and your amygdala kicked in. So, um, yes, I, I view networking as nothing. So when I get in an environment, you know, it's a billion dollar architecture and it's not working. And somebody's like, Mike, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. We're losing money and I take a deep breath. I get to it and I go through it. And they're like, why aren't you stressed? And I say, is anybody going to die if I don't fix this in the next three seconds? And they say, no. And I'm like, then it's a vacation for me. Because that's what I did working in the emergency department. How did I pay my way through college? I was a paramedic. I dealt with life and death things. So me, this is nothing. It's just networking things. It's a packet. It's not working. We figure it out. So I do utilize a technique called box breathing. Um, and I'm also going to bring Todd McLaughlin back on my channel. So Todd McLaughlin um, trained with the Joyce family in India. He trained uh, in Thailand. And he also trained with uh, Bikram himself. And he's been teaching yoga for a while. He is my guruji as it pertains to yoga. He hates being called guru. Um, but, you know, since he trained with guruji himself, Patabi Joyce, and the other guruji himself, um, uh, um, Bikram, you know, for me, um, he's my guru. I've been working with him. So that's kind of the thing. So it's the thing. It's just mental toughness. Just keep fighting, 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 and you'll get there. Can someone compare the CCNA to the CompTIA Plus? I tell everybody to never do any CompTIA certifications ever. 
And here's why. They are good certifications. There's nothing wrong with them. But except for the U.S. government, employers don't care about them. So what is the CompTIA A+, plus, Network Plus good for? The people that work at the Geek Squad at the Best Buy that repair your PC. Not really kind of any industrial jobs. Potentially help desks. So the CCNA is about a thousand times more valuable than the CompTIA Network Plus. I would never get the CompTIA Network Plus. There's no point in it. Um, do the CCNA, the CCIE, the CCNA, the CCNP. They're the only networking certifications you're going to need. And uh, the CCNP will give you a lot to get hired. <laughs> Ruth, you currently have a networking background. Fantastic. CCNA and CCNP. Okay. Um, but it's currently expired and later switched to cyber security. What can you do to get hired as a cloud architect? Well, Ruth, if you truly understand networking and have CCNP knowledge and CCNA knowledge, real networking, and you understand BGP tuning and traffic engineering and OSPF and QoS and VLAN tagging and VLAN trunking, you already have half of it. So then, assuming you know all of that from a design perspective, and if you don't know the architect part of it, um, study it from us or study it from somewhere else. Learn the design because remember, architects don't configure, we design. So learn the network, learn the data center, switches, routers, VLANs, trunking, tagging, BGP, IPsec, etc., etc. Learn servers, server virtualizations, containers, firewalls, VPN concentrators, storage, etc. Then focus on developing your leadership skills, your communication skills, your emotional intelligence, your presentation skills, your business skills, your business acumen, your CXO relevancy, etc., etc., etc. And then guess what? You will have an easy, easy, easy time getting a job. So that's really the key. It's building the portfolio that shows you're a cross between a business exec and a technology professional, having the business acumen, the networking acumen, and the data center acumen, and then just knowing what, what are those network and data center equivalent services in the cloud, and then which service to use and how to do it, and knowing business well enough to be able to interact with an executive, figure out what their business problems are, and craft a technology solution. So Ruth, that's the skill, and that's the process, and you can go out there and get yourself cloud hired easily. Chris, if you want to bring in the next one. Okay, so, you know, to be fair, somebody asked about reading a 1,000 pages a day. Um, that's not normal. And I know that's not normal. Um, so here's the thing. Um, I have a laser-like focus that's bordering on the obsessive-compulsive side without being in the disorder. And here's what happened. Um, when I went to college, I was really, really poor. I mean, to the point where if I could fill up, if I had gas in my tank to survive the next day, I was really in good shape. So what did I do when I was in college? I worked full time as a paramedic. And uh, that enabled me to, I went to school from seven to three, from three to 11, I worked on the ambulances. Three days a week from 11 to seven, I also worked on the ambulances. And then on Saturday and Sunday, I worked 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And I did that for four years straight. So when I was in school, in order to survive, I learned how to read. I learned how to basically be able to read through the content, find exactly what the critical stuff was, pull it out and remember it, and then go. Now, when I learned healthcare things, again, it was like learning another language. So because of that, that's why I learned how to read very fast. So I do read differently than other people. I do learn at a different rate than other people. But... You know what? Other people learn a lot faster than me. I went into my wife's medical office one day and I heard her say in Spanish, on a scale of one to 10, one is a little, little bit and 10 is a whole lot worse than having a baby. How much does it hurt? And you know, it wasn't the usual medical professional of te duele. I mean, it was detail oriented Spanish. And I went, wow. And she said, my translators couldn't understand my thoughts. So what was I going to do? I got a dictionary and I memorized things. So the point is, you can all do anything you can imagine. And I got to tell you, I've been coaching people forever. I have seen people do amazing things. I had a student, his name was Richard Afukar. He was in my program for three weeks before he got hired by Amazon. But he bought three private interviews, and I think he was up 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because when I spoke to him, he said, I haven't slept in four days. But that's why Amazon hired him. I had another amazing student. His name was Coyote. Um, actually, and Yvonne, they're two students that just got hired by Amazon with zero tech background whatsoever. 
One was working as a waiter and one was working something else, but not tech. But what did they do? They put in the oomph, 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 oomph. So in martial arts, we say hard work beats talent when talent doesn't try. And let me tell you, in my experience, it's the people that will just do, 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 and do. And you know what? If you read a little slow right now, don't worry. Say start with 10 pages. Stretch it out. Go to 11 tomorrow. Go to 12 the next day. And if you're a 12 for a week, fine. Go to 15 the next time. You'll see as you do more of it, you get much, much better at it and you learn it much quicker. So that's my thing. So um, let's do this. We've been here for a while. I don't want to keep you too late because we've got two weeks. If you can all type hashtag CCNA and write hashtag your geography, we'll end the day and we'll have fun tomorrow when we get to more networking related stuff. I just like knowing where everybody's from. And if you can, hit the like button, comment, subscribe, tell a friend. We want as many people to be helped by this video as possible. Okay, I'm starting to see the CCNAs pop in. Um, Dan Steer, Cornwall, UK. I love that. Um, Nikhil, CCNA. I know where you're at, Nikhil. Sharon, CCNA. Anthony in Kansas. I love it in Kansas. I spent a lot of time in McPherson, Wichita, and uh, Kansas City, although it's Missouri. Twinkle, you're in India. I love that. Brian, CCNA. To Dallas, fantastic. Robert's over there in Dallas. I love that. Robert's a great security guy. Brian's from Phil in Philly. That's where I'm from. Marla's uh, in Atlanta. I love that. Avu Malik, uh, it's good to see you. You got one of my favorite musicians listening there. I hope everything's Irie. Um, uh, good to see you, Danica. CJ, good to see you. Tom Worthy is in the Netherlands. I always love that. Um, Gabriel in Zambia, fantastic. NASCO, Frankfurt, Germany, fantastic. Dimson Mentor, I know you real well. ET, good to see you. Danica, good to see you. Cloud Hired. Earl O and CCNA in Tacoma, awesome. I see Egypt over here. I see Maryland over here. Network Bush, you're in Orlando. We should meet one day. I'm in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Hand to God, CCNA, good to see you. Dan, Chicago, wanted to see you. CCNA, Bangladesh, fantastic. Uh, Maryland, I love that. Um, Eva Doikia, Seven Series, good to see you. Sharon, wonderful to see you. Muscat, fantastic. CCNA, are you in Pakistan? That's wonderful. Frank Soto is in Portland, Maine. Fantastic. Millicent's in Maryland. Um, Dave is in Beltsville, Maryland. I love that. CCNA, FM, great to see you. Kulani, you're in Taiwan. How terrific. And how international. AKs in India, I'm loving this. Okay, fantastic. Glasgow, Scotland. Boy, I spent a lot of time there a while back. Leo's in Brazil. William is in Massachusetts. Um, and Evo Doik is there in Denmark. Fantastic. AK's in India. And Mohammed's over there in Egypt. ET, Maryland. Lisbon, Portugal. Wow. Tech with Mufaz over there in Nigeria. I love that. CCNA in India. Birmingham, Alabama. Hand to God. That's fantastic. Uh, oh, Birmingham, UK. Okay. Fantastic. I've been there quite a bit. Alex is in Boston. Um, fantastic. And Ruth is in Maryland. I'm loving this. Rocket flies, Florida. Well, we got both Chris and I are in Florida. And uh, I think there we go. So, and Mark is in New York City. Mark, I'm loving that. Um, I see some great things out of Mark all the time. Mark's really, really capable and really, really smart. So, thank you all. Have a wonderful night. And I will see you all tomorrow. And we'll be talking about some more IP related things. Um, we'll, get, we'll start with submitting, but it'll be fun. I promise. I'll make it interesting. <laughs>